Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, sir. <laughs> Good afternoon, Professor Mao Sundari Sen. Hi. Hi. Hello, sir. How are you? Robin Bhatta from Kharagpur. Uh, hi. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Two more minutes.
we will wait for two more minutes as some participants have difficulty joining two more minutes please <laughs> Good morning, Robert. This is Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Well, good afternoon, I'm sure. Good afternoon, yeah. <laughs> The, the first presenter, so that's the reason I'm waiting for a minute or so. Is it sorted out now?
You online now? Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good to see you. Hello. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about the delay. We'll get started. Greetings from uh, Bangalore. I am Professor D. U. Kulkarni. President of uh, the host institute uh, for this meeting, JNCSR. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the joint users meeting of synchrotron and neutron projects at Petra, KEK, and ISIS RAL, supported by DST Nanomission. As per the program, the meeting is scheduled till tomorrow evening. And due to the pandemic, Many are participating online. We have our colleagues and students within the institute participating here in the hall, observing all the norms. We are truly grateful to Professor Sienna Rao for his gracious presence for this meeting. I warmly welcome you, sir. And with your kind permission, I will now read out the message you sent for the occasion. Professor Rao's message, quote, Dear friends, we all know that synchrotron has many uses, as is evident by the increase of innumerable users of diverse disciplines. Every day, the number of users has multiplied exponentially. Thanks to their contributions, the level of science has gone up in India. I congratulate all the users and wish many more of the clan use this unique facility and contribute by the diverse activities in the years to come. With best wishes, Professor C. N. Rao, March 4, 2021, JNCSR, Bangalore. Unquote. Thank you, sir. I also extend a warm welcome to Professor Helmut Dosch, the C. Director of DC Germany, Professor Nabumasa Funamori, Director of Photon Factory Japan, and Professor Robert McGreevy, Director RAL UK. And on this occasion, I welcome my colleagues, Professor Milan Sanyal, Professor Ajay Sood, and Mr. Milin Kulkarni, Beam Coordinators from JNC, as well as the DST staff. And also a warm welcome to all the user participants. On behalf of DST Nanomission, this center has been coordinating the utilization of synchrotron beam lines at DESI and KEK for the interested users, as also the neutron and muon facilities at RAL. The coordinates of these projects from JNCSR are Professor Kanishka Biswas, Professor Sebastian Peter, and Professor A. Sundarishan. The same order. Uh, they have been successfully coordinating these projects under the guidance of the principal investigator of this project. Professor Milan K. Sanyal from Saha Institute. I'm glad our former coordinator, Professor Chandrabas, is here with us this afternoon. Welcome you all. While the details of uh, how to go about applying for the facility and uh, seek support from the project, they're all posted on the JNCSR website. Uh, I take this opportunity to welcome more and more users. This information has to get more disseminated and we should be welcoming more users as we go along to use these facilities for their own research activities. On this occasion, we must thank Professor CNR Rao, under whose visionary guidance these facilities have been initiated with the support of DST Nanomission. And I also thank DC, KEK, and RAL 
for providing infrastructure at their respective places to use these facilities for our research. I'm not sure how long this pandemic will last, but we should be hopeful that we'll be able to personally visit. I've had the pleasure of going to Desi a couple of times and using the facilities, and we did have did collect some good set of data and also publish, but I hope those times will come back. We'll be able to go around personally and collaborate with the beam scientists and use these facilities. With these words, I once again welcome you all to this meeting. And let us get started with the formal program. Uh, we have uh, Professor Milan K. Sanyal, the principal investigator of these projects, speaking to us on X-ray synchrotron and neutron projects, essentially the details of these projects. Milan, are you ready? Your microphone is muted. Is it okay now? Yes, perfect. Please okay. get started. Yeah. It's great to see Professor Rao uh, attending this meeting. And then I can see, uh, of course, my friend, uh, Professor Kulkarni, and uh, Professor Helmut Dosh and uh, uh, Robert, and uh, I can see Kiki Sharma, my friend, and uh, uh, many others. If I keep on telling that, then five minutes will go uh, in this name uttering. So I will not take much time, but I uh, still recall that when we started all these three projects, uh, Professor Rao told me personally that it is very important to carry users right from the day one. So all the three projects which we are uh, executing quite successfully uh, started with three user meetings even before we went and signed or initiated the projects. All these three user meetings actually were held in uh, JNCASR. So it is very appropriate that we are having this user meeting uh, in, in JNCASR again. This is just to uh, uh, reassure ourselves that this COVID days will get to work and uh, projects which are international in nature and requires travel and everything uh, will we'll be working again in full swing. Uh, I remember that uh, uh, in the one discussion meeting which was held on September 15, uh, 2008, uh, before starting the DAISY program, and I remember at that time uh, my friend Helmut Dosh was just taking over uh, the as Director General of that place, and we had a very nice meeting in uh, in uh, JNCASR, and then finally, January uh, 2009, Professor Rao visited, and then we signed the LOI, letter of uh, intention and whatever, and then finally, agreement was signed in presence of Chancellor Germany and Prime Minister India in Delhi. Uh, I must tell that all these three projects have really received a very nice uh, support from International Division DST and our MEA, Ministry of External Affairs, including uh, very senior ministers and prime ministers. So we are grateful for that. And uh, uh, more than 50 institutes across the country are using these three projects. Very good publications have come and the purpose of this meeting is to improve it further. As uh, my uh, senior colleague, Professor Ajay Sood, keeps on telling that uh, much better paper should come from these projects. And uh, so we, these user meetings are very important for that. Uh, the the uh, nano mission is supporting all these three projects. And I would like to go on record to thank uh, uh, my friend Bilin Kulkarni and other members of DST for giving this extra support. Photon Factory actually started, uh, this project started uh, much earlier, even before the initiation of Nano Mission. It was started in a India-Japan Science Council meeting, again with initiative of Professor Rao, 
and we similarly had a user meeting in JNCASR in July 24, uh, 2007. And then, of course, Professor Rao again signed this LOI and uh, all this happened. And first steering committee meeting was held in June 25, 2009 in Indian Embassy, Tokyo. And I remember uh, uh, Ajay Sood and uh, Dhananjay Pandey and we, some of us, uh, old people, we were there in that meeting. Uh, the last one which we started is the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory for Neutron Access. And again, here we had this user meeting on August uh, 8, 2013. And uh, Robert came and also my friends from Lagridge came and few others. And then we had a follow-up meeting in Rutherford Lab uh, in uh, January 2015 when again, Professor Rao came and we signed the LOI. Finally, the Ministry, uh, Minister of Science and Technology, uh, Dr. Harshavardhan came over, and this project is also running very well. The status of all these three projects are the following. A photon factory, we have finished already two phases, and actually about 13 years, it is running quite successfully. Uh, uh, and uh, we are about to submit the third phase for the support to DST. Uh, Petra, first phase uh, got over, second phase got approval already, and the experiments will start. And uh, I'm very happy to see my friend Chandravas on the, on the uh, video. And the RAL also it started at the end, but uh, we, uh, we have contributed significantly in the construction of a beamline zoom. And uh, uh, we have finished just or about to finish the first phase and second phase has to be written. So this user meeting is very important to generate uh, all the three projects, input from users and what are the difficulties and I'm so happy to see that uh, the three directors from these three centers, in spite of their busy schedule, have agreed to address this uh, gathering. And I, I will stop here and then uh, give the uh, microphone back to uh, Professor Kutlani. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you, Professor Samuel. I will now invite uh, Professor Helmut Dosh, Director DC, for his remarks. Okay, okay. okay. So maybe mute the microphone of those who are not speaking, then we avoid the echo. Yeah, thank you very much. So again, so uh, also pleasure to be here. It's really a pleasure and an honor simultaneously. It's really great to see Sienna Rao here, who is really you know, behind everything we are doing. So it's really a great pleasure to see you. And I hope you are doing well also in, during this pandemic. Uh, so it's really a, a pleasure to see you, honestly. So, but I see a lot of good friends here. So uh, it's also a pleasure. And we are all suffering uh, from uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, and we would actually like to see. Um, uh, do you see my slides? No. OK. Oops. Yes, I can see. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. Okay, so uh, some things. So maybe this is working. Uh, so uh, again, so I'm uh, very happy uh, uh, and honored uh, to participate in this user meeting uh, to give a couple of words of greetings. Um, so uh, uh, um, um, uh, my friend uh, Milan alluded to this launching in uh, 2011 when we launched this uh, this uh, cooperation. Uh, Daisy and uh, the India X-ray Science, and this was a very festive event. I should say uh, we arrived here. Uh, Chancellor Merkel and myself arrived here with three hours delay because the, because because the the plane could not travel through Iran. 
for three hours and uh, we were circling around and then we arrived uh, quite late. And you see also here a very nice events. Uh, so you see here in 2012 when the first user me uh, users came and did some work and we have these regular uh, meetings uh, together and also of course celebrating our success uh, regularly. So for those of you who have never been uh, in Hamburg, you know, this is Europe, you know, this is Germany, here on top, you know, is Hamburg, and this is the city of Hamburg, there are very important uh, buildings here, the city hall, the new symphony house, and if you come to Hamburg, you must go there, it's fascinating, we have Airbus here, and the most important one is here in the northwest part of um, uh, Hamburg, you know, our, our laboratory, DAISY, as you know, so we are operating various facilities, in particular the big storage ring Petra 3, but we are also operating a flash uh, soft X-ray laser facility and uh, the big uh, superconducting uh, 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 European X-ray laser, uh, who is now operational since 2017 and it works uh, marvelously. And um, so India at DAISY, how we call our, our cooperation is primarily using Petra 3, but of course, uh, all the other facilities are also open uh, for uh, India users. So we are all struck by the Corona, so I can say, so in March last year, so we had, uh, of course, a stressful period, you know, to transform our lab into a new mode, which we call safe operation mode, uh, which is actually quite effective. Uh, uh, and uh, we uh, this allowed, you know, a safe operation of Petra 3 and Flash, particularly open for Corona related work, but now we are doing very uh, strongly mail in and remote experiments. And this could be also interesting also for uh, the cooperation with India. I can say so we were extremely impressed by the, ex uh, by the avalanche of requests from medical people from virolo virologists from hospitals uh, which needed our infrastructures for drug screening for improving uh, the vaccine so biontech is working with us since many months but we are also doing uh, uh, so to speak in, uh, tracking uh, uh, t-cells from the immune systems we do help the doctors uh, to understand better what uh, now the disease really is in the lungs. So we have high resolution lung tissues. We are now doing also heart uh, tissue uh, 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 tomography, but because there's also um, uh, 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 so damages uh, 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 observed. So this is all uh, uh, working uh, very well. And uh, so it gives you know, actually a new dimension to this uh, X-ray facilities. So we are, as you know, working at the moment to convert Petra 3 into a, a 3D zoom microscope by implementing a new uh, technology, which is the uh, hybrid seven band Acromat technology. Uh, we have Ricardo Bartolini as the leading person here. And you see that the spatial resolution, uh, in this case, the further you are down, the better you are. You know, at the moment, people are here, and this is, so to speak, the next champion league. And ESRF is down, Max4 is here. And if we are, you know, working this out, uh, then you know, we are moving from here mm -hmm. to the highest resolution uh, possible. So this would, so if everything works out, this will be the world leading facility in this respect. So we are uh, also having, a, a, I think I should tell you because it's interesting, I guess for you, we have a big initiative, Digital Daisy, where we are now uh, preparing the lab for post-corona times. So, to, uh, so uh, actually it's a project which affects the whole laboratory, but very important for our collaboration is that we are striving, you know, to uh, create in the mid and long run, you know, accelerate the operation which is partly or totally driven in an autonomous mode uh, we go into better uh, using artificial intelligence for all that also from the operation of the accelerator down to the data uh, analysis and we are you know including now a new robotics uh, which allow in future 
a very, very uh, efficient uh, remote operation uh, for users who cannot travel or for various reasons also to save uh, travel time and, uh, and uh, environmental pollution. So we will have that in the future more, much more than in the past. And this could also be interesting for uh, the, 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 uh, the cooperation with India. So this affects many things, so I should not go too much in it, but artificial intelligence concepts uh, will now be used in all of these areas. And as, I, as we speak, uh, many, many uh, new corporations are implemented and also new uh, technologies uh, are built up, but also new people uh, are recruited in order to really move that important field forward. It runs under the name Digital Daisy here. Um, so also something which uh, many of you know, we have this many interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary platforms. So one is for ultrafast science is Seafelt, and one is for structural biology is CSSB, many, many cooperation partners. So we have one uh, on nanotechnology. This opens up uh, this year uh, where we merge X-ray science and nanoscience together. And this is now moving forward an interdisciplinary science center, uh, Wolfgang Pauli Center, uh, where we merge, you know, uh, uh, theorists from all disciplines together uh, to really leverage synergy. And we are, uh, will create a center for molecular water science, where we are already in contract, uh, contact with Indian scientists. And uh, so this is a, a future premium application for uh, uh, here in Hamburg and also with uh, uh, cooperation partners. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I thank you again for this pleasant collaboration in the past and we are really looking very much forward for the next years to come and i think uh, the future is uh, uh, has plenty of discoveries and plenty of innovations which we can do together and it's uh, really a pleasure uh, to have this cooperation with india and then looking forward uh, for our future uh, joint efforts thank you very much thank you professor dosh for your presentation and remarks. We will now have remarks by Professor Funamori, Director of the Factory. Professor Funamori. Yes. So can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. And um, can you see my slides? Yes, we do. Oh, okay. okay. So good, good evening and or good, af good afternoon for people in India. I'm Nobumasa Funamori, the director of Photon Factory INSS KK. And this slide shows the overview of our facility. And uh, we operate two rings, photon PF ring and PF AR ring in Tsukuba, KK Tsukuba campus. The PF ring, 2.5 GB, 150 milliampere, 39 stations, including uh, BL18B, first type hard X ray station, uh, DST India. The operation started in 1982. And having we have two twice large uh, upgrades in 1996 and 2005, and the other one is PFAR, uh, uh, PF uh, advanced ring, uh, so-called PFAR, 6.5 GB, uh, 50 milliampere, and eight stations, and operate op the operation started in 1987, and always in single bunch mode to produce pulsed hard X-rays. Now we uh, that now the two rings are operated in simultaneous top-up injection mode since nine uh, since 2018. The BL18B, uh, the Indian beam line was constructed in 2009, and uh, since then have achieved a great success. This. This, this station, PL18B, 
has published 39 papers in phase one and 83 papers in phase two uh, period. And users from 42 Indian institutes and universities uh, uh, joined our uh, uh, facility to conduct experiment. And we are very proud of Indian Beamline having many users from India and many publications in high impact channels by users. Please note that uh, all our beam lines of photon factories are open for any academic users. So you can submit a proposal to other beam lines. Here is a beam line map. We have various kinds of experimental stations for VUV and soft X-rays and for X-ray diffraction, for X-ray spectroscopy, and for life science. Again, you can submit a proposal to all of them in addition to the Indian beamline. Here, I'm happy to announce the extension of MOU between uh, DSD Government of India and KK will be signed on March 23rd, 2021, this month, for a period of one year, one year beginning on April 1st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022. It's time, I think, it's time to, we think it's time to think the, uh, see the possibility of phase three for further success of the collaboration. And the information from the photon factory side is summarized in the next page. The future plan and user time. The PF upgrade for the improvement of stability and brightness of the X-ray beam has been started in 2020. The PF upgrade will be conducted continuously for five, 10 years without shutdown. And network system of experimental four will be strengthened in 2021 for remote experiment. So remote experiment may be possible from India. And user time has been about uh, 30, 100 hours in recent years, but uh, we will have, uh, the user time will be uh, 3,600 hours in 2021 fiscal year. And the con uh, conceptual design of the new facility to be realized in the 2030s is under consideration by photon factory staff. So, Again, we are always open for collaboration to advance synchrotron radiation research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Namuri. Thank you. Uh, we will now have uh, remarks by Professor Robert McGrevy, Director RIL. Thank you, Dr. We are able to see your slides. Will you please unmute your microphone? Please unmute your microphone. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute while I was sharing. Okay, so so uh, I'm very pleased to uh, be here at this virtual meeting, and I'd like to virtually welcome you to the ISIS facility. Um, my colleague Sean Langwood will talk tomorrow a lot in a lot of detail about the collaboration with the with the nano mission. Um, so, so I will confine myself to general things about ISIS 
because I recognize that many of the people on this call will be more familiar with synchrotrons and, and uh, the free electron laser than the neutron and muon sources. So, so ISIS is a world-leading facility for neutron scattering and neutron spectroscopy. We've been operating since 1994. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, the early pioneering sources, uh, accelerator-based neutron sources, was actually at, at also at KEK next to the photon factory. So that was Ken's, which is recently, well, sorry, has since closed down. And, and actually, India was one of the first collaborators in the ISIS neutron source. One of our first instruments was actually built in, in India. So it's been a very long running partnership, um, but that was relaunched in 2016 with an animation. Uh, ISIS uh, built a second target station in 2008. It's, it's a UK national facility. It's not an international facility in principle, but we have many long running international partnerships. And I'd, I'd like to stress the word partnership because it's, it's very important for us that not only do we get um, international users from other countries, but also that we build those relationships and that scientific research partnership. And I think many people have used the word friend uh, so far in this meeting. And, and for us, that's a really important thing. People, uh, people don't just work with machines, they work with people. And it's building those research relationships that, that make these collaborations not only scientifically successful, but also long running. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to make the point that we are, we're not really a research institution, we're, we are a user facility. Our major role is to provide uh, the, the neutron and muon techniques for international users and to work together with them, in the, work together with you in partnership to produce excellent science and technology. Uh, so, so for those of you not so familiar with uh, neutrons and muons, uh, rather more familiar with, with the photons, then these are really complementary techniques to what you might do with many other experimental techniques. But they do provide very particular insights into certain aspects of materials. And I'll just uh, illustrate a, a few here. So for example, magnetism, because the neutron has a magnetic moment, it's one of the fundamental probes for, for magnetism. And the, the muon is also a very sensitive probe of, of magnetism. So those two techniques in, in collaboration are extremely Going in in uh, to, together, extremely useful together. Uh, the, the neutron is also very very penetrating into materials. So so for example, we can study residual stress in in real life components. Uh, the, the example I'm showing here just happens to come from uh, a nuclear power reactor, very critical component. And by studying stress stress in this particular component in the UK, we've had we've managed to relife some of our power stations for an additional five years. That's a very important uh, economic contribution. Uh, when we come out of the pandemic, which hopefully is very, very soon, so we can all go back to working together more closely, then, for example, uh, antibacterials will be equally as important as, as antivirals are at the moment. And that, that will resurface itself in, in a year or two's time. So, so uh, below the residual stress studies, I show some results of neutron scattering studies working on antibacterials. We get very unique information by using the difference between hydrogen and deuterium in materials. So using what we call deuterium contrast labeling to pick out particular bits of complex systems. Uh, we study battery, battery materials, uh, energy storage materials, using neutrons being very good at looking at light elements. So for example, hydrogen or lithium. Um, and similar things happening, for example, in, in catalysis. So the neutron and muon techniques are extremely useful in combination with photon techniques, with techniques in, in laboratories, for example, like at GNCSR with the excellent equipment there for studying these really complicated systems. ICC itself is, is now, uh, we're operating two target stations, 33 instruments. So this makes us one of the, it's one of the biggest neutron scattering operations, neutron and muon operations in the world. We, we are, it's a very large operation. Uh, we run a lot of support laboratories, support equipment and so on. We have users from 37 different countries. Uh, India is one of the largest participants, uh, but it's where we are very international and really, really usually carry out thousands of experiments each year, even this year with, with the COVID. We've actually carried out almost, uh, well, we've carried over, over a thousand experiments this year, uh, most of those, that now remotely with a very large number of publications. And we, we're quite used through the pandemic to talking about exponential growth of things, but the, 
the growth of the Indian youth community using ISIS over the last four years really has been exponential. We started with two, user, two institutions using ISIS back in 2016. Now there are 20 institutions using ISIS. So it's been a, a, a very strong growth um, and we really welcome that partnership. So I really look forward to, to when the pandemic is, is over or at least is, is under control and we can start welcoming uh, you back to our laboratory um, and having and having those collaborations. Thank you. I now invite uh, Professor Ajay Sood, uh, the steering committee uh, related to these projects. Professor Sood. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni. Uh, thank you for having me in this today's uh, meeting, uh, uh, looking at all the three interactions of Indian scientists from Petra 3, KEK, and ISIS. Uh, as I have been associated with these programs right from the beginning, I'm very happy to see that these the interactions have really strengthened over the years, and it has been extremely uh, fruitful and enjoyable for Indian uh, scientists and hopefully from the other side as well because it's a, it has been a very nice learning experience and now our community has also expanded as uh, it was mentioned over the number of institutes and uh, new users and so on. So it is really nice to see that uh, what it started about 10 years back uh, when this interaction started, from then on, it has really built up on uh, mutual respect and mutual trust. And it has been a very inter exp interesting experience for all of us. So thank you to all the three uh, people, uh, Professor Funamori, Professor Dosh, and Professor Robert, to really make it happen in a very uh, interactive and uh, enjoyable manner. Uh, I uh, do realize and all of us do realize that uh, last one year has unusual. Uh, and I'm very hopeful now with vaccine on board and traveling restrictions are almost on and off getting uh, loosened we will uh, recover and uh, hopefully do our interactions in three dimensions very soon. And uh, uh, this has been, uh, we, I mean, we are looking forward to that. And uh, I'm sure in uh, next few years, it will be a very, very fruitful interaction. And uh, I thank all the users who have really benefited by this interaction. Uh, we will hear their uh, presentations and uh, uh, hope that uh, this interaction will grow with time. And I also hope that we will have some major breakthroughs in years to come. I mean, we have come to a good level, but we really need to make some breakthroughs also using these facilities along with our other science, which we are doing. So I am hopeful of that. And I'm very hopeful that DST support uh, will continue in uh, all uh, uh, in all ways. And Milind is here, so uh, he is doing his best to really make sure that these interactions continue in a very uh, flourishing manner. So thank you, Milind, for making all this happen. And uh, I'm sure under the new uh, avatar of Nano Mission. Uh, all these things will continue. So uh, I'm sure, uh, let's hope that uh, we will go uh, to higher heights using these facilities. So thank you once again for having me uh, in this inaugural session. And I wish all the very best to all the users and the future users. And thank you once again to our three partners. Uh, this is really has been an excellent experience once again. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Professor Kulkarni. Professor Sooth, thank you. Yes, 
Yes. Uh, we will now hear from uh, Mr. Milind Kulkarni from DST on the DST perspectives. Milind ji. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to uh, you know announce that we are going in for the uh, phase uh, two phase two uh, extension of uh, KEK on 23rd of uh, March. The agreement will be signed and uh, we will go to 31st March 2022 as the end date. But next year we are also taking a you know uh, also sort of getting together to prepare a DPR for the phase three, which uh, I think uh, uh, the director has agreed. And uh, even the uh, in the joint task force meeting, the Japanese side have agreed to do that. And I'm really grateful to all the three countries for having, uh, you know, for having spared the valuable time in uh, coming for this users meeting and address the users uh my uh, one request would be if uh, we can have some you know uh, workshops for the new users to bring to bring new users into the uh, net and that would be a really good thing that we can do for the uh, benefit of all the three countries uh with uh, I think the agreement with uh, RAL UK and also with uh, uh, DAISY has already fluctuated. Uh, RAL UK, we are going to uh, move in the next year for the second phase. And with uh, 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 DAISY, we already signed the second phase last year. So uh, I think we will be moving fast into that uh, uh, faster mode uh, because of the pandemic. and. My request to my colleagues is also to see to it that this continues uh, further, at least for the next 20 years, so that we come up with real, uh, you know, good publications and breakthrough, as Professor Sooth had said. In the next five years, I expect at least one or two breakthroughs in this collaboration. Thank you. I thank all the speakers, presenters of this inaugural session. And my colleague, Mr. Jay Chandra, has a long list of uh, people to thank. Mr. Jay Chandra. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni. Respected uh, Bharat Ratna, Professor. Mike? Respected Bharat Ratna, Professor Siena Rao. Professor Jeev Kulkarni, President JNCSR. Professor Helmut Dosh. Professor Funamori. Professor Robert Megrave. Professor Milan Sanyal. Professor Ajay Sood. Mr. Milin Kulkarni and uh, Poonam from DST. All the distinguished speakers. And many users of the synchrotron facilities who have been who have been able to participate in this meeting and all the eminent personalities from RAL, KEK and Petra as also the members of the JNC community here. It's my honor to thank you all for making it possible to join this meeting despite the busy schedule, pressure for performance and multitasking in this period as also COVID pandemic. In fact, it is Professor CNR Rao who has been encouraging coming together of all scientists time and again in order to promote science and put best practices in science in India. And this is one of such event. Sir, our heartful thanks to you for being able to be here with us today as also for your good wishes for this meeting. Uh, Professor Jeev Kulkarni, President JNCA, sir, has not only encouraged us to convene this meeting, but also went into the nitty gritties of various issues and how the program needs to be held. In fact, this program was supposed to be held last year and due to the pandemic, we have, uh, we have now convened this meeting. Uh, we are grateful to Professor Helmut Dosh, Professor Funamori, 
and Professor Robert uh, Megrave for their for being able to be with us on in this occasion, despite different time zones therein, and they had to adjust their biological biological clocks to give their insights. Many thanks all of you for introducing the facilities and also welcoming Indian researchers. And I'm sure that this will certainly lead into new possibilities in science. Professor Ajay Sood has been mentoring various programs of the nano mission in India and in Karnataka too. His contributions are recognized with a Re recognized everywhere and with a short notice he was able to join with us and professor milan sanyal who has been instrumental in various synchrotron initiatives in india has been you know very helpful in various initiatives and he has also helped us in organizing this meeting and i thank him for his constant support I have to specially thank all the users who are who are present here, despite their busy schedules. I will uh, fail in my duty if I do not thank Professor N. Chandrabas, who has been coordinating the synchrotron programs from the beginning from JNCSR side. Now he is uh, the director of the RGCB in Trivandrum, and also Professor Rinmoy from SINP. Who has been of immense help in various programs. Professor A. Sundreshan, Professor Kanishka Biswas, and Professor Sebastian are not only looking after the implementation of these programs in JNC and for the whole uh, country, but they have also worked hard to put the program schedule for this, you know, program for this users' meeting. And I have to also thank JNC administration under the stewardship of uh, Mr. Jaydeep Deb, who have been helpful in coordinating this program. And uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Shreya and Moinak, who have extended technical support in putting the, putting up the talks as well as also the connecting the meeting online. The conference hall team, Mr. Peer Munegoda, Dilip. Srinivas and others, the garden and housekeeping staff, the canteen staff have been very helpful and, and I, I, I thank them. A special thanks to uh, my colleague Prema, who has been working hard for this uh, program. And with this, I conclude uh, uh, the, the, this first session of the program and I request all of you who are, who are present to join for tea. Thank you all. You should send a cup of tea here also, yeah. Virtually, you mean. Virtually. <laughs> you, can at least, you can at least show us no? <laughs> like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, we...
थ्री
so good afternoon and welcome back for the technical session so uh, i am kanishka biswas uh, from jncsr bangalore and i am uh, currently coordinating this uh, indian user access to petra 3 beam lines in desi uh, project uh, and before me uh, this project was coordinated by uh, professor chandravas uh, I, I i think uh, uh, all of you uh, will uh, hear him uh, after me just after me so uh, uh, first two three minutes i'll give a very brief overview of this uh, indian access to this desi and then I, I, i'll hand over to chandravas so uh, so this is the phase one summary which uh, chandravas was leading from jncsr and you can see that uh, indian users are uh, actually uh, used uh, beam time allotted beam time heavily and uh, but in the phase two uh, we could only use uh, this much and uh, we stopped around december uh, uh, 16 we used last in 2019 which is uh, the beam line of professor sebastian peter and after that we could not use the beam line because of uh, 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 covid pandemic but some of the users have uh, used the beam lines by uh, sending uh, samples and at the discussion uh, uh, at the end of this uh, technical session uh, uh, tomorrow uh, we'll discuss about that how to access uh, these beam lines during this pandemic session so there are several institutes in india uh, who have used this uh, uh, beam time in desi there are 64 institutes and then uh, the the productivity in terms of uh, research and publication is uh, significant as you can see there are several high quality publications came uh, out of uh, this project uh, uh, and the total number of publication is now 164 uh, uh, like combining phase 1 and phase 2 and you can see there are several important paper came out of this uh, beam lines published in this uh, important journals and with that uh, i i finish my talk uh, here and uh, uh, let's start uh, the technical session and before i invite chandravas uh, I would uh, like to request all the speaker in this session to finish the technical talk by 13 minutes and leave two minutes for uh, 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 pro probable questions. So with that, I invite Professor Chandravas Narana, who is currently the director of RGCB. And uh, of course, he is uh, 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 also in JNCSR uh, 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 in, the, in the Department of Chemistry and Physics Materials Unit. So uh, Chandravas. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening for all the people who have joined from different parts of the country. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, 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 Professor Kanishka Vishwas, uh, Professor Sebastian Peter, and uh, Professor Sundareshan uh, for inviting me for this particular uh, user meeting. And uh, I would like to specially thank uh, Professor uh, Jiu Kulkarni and Professor Sian Rao for actually allowing me and uh, uh, before him, all the directors of uh, JNCSR for uh, running this program substantially, uh, a substantial amount of time. Uh, my uh, uh, partner in crime always has had been uh, Professor Milan Sanyal and also uh, Professor Minmoy uh, from SINP. So uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Milind and Poonam for uh, helping us extensively, and Professor Rajay Sood and uh, all the steering committee members of uh, both KEK and uh, uh, DESI. And one more person I would like to specially thank is Wolfgang uh, uh, he, uh, Drube, who has been a very, very constant help for me for helping the users in India to make it possible to attend all the beamline uh, assignments. I um, cho chose this topic uh, for a specific reason because uh, I, I have a great passion for high pressure research and I have chosen some two examples here uh, to uh, highlight why synchrotron needs to be available for us to do such uh, work. One is very, very high pressures and uh, another one is to study temperature and pressure uh, studies uh, on samples inside a high pressure cell. So with that, I will actually thank all uh, the people who were actually responsible for this. These are uh, uh, Professor Ab Abhay Shukla, Professor uh, Guillaume Piquet, and Professor Alan uh, Polia, and then uh, Dr. Christoph Bellin. Uh, all 
all of them uh, were with me while doing these experiments on synchrotron and we developed a extensive uh, uh, knowledge during these uh, experiments. While doing these kinds of experiments, we need to use membrane cells, which are actually very easy to operate because there is no mechanical parts moving here, except the gas is actually pressurizing it. And it works on diamond anvil cell. I won't go into the detail because of the lack of uh, time. Uh, it's basically we use neon gas as the pressure transmitting medium. And uh, to find out the pressure inside the gasket, we actually use uh, um, uh, let me get the laser point. We use uh, equation of state of gold or the gasket material. Then uh, pressure, as you, all of us know, is actually force per unit area. So when you reduce the area, uh, if you put a five ton weight on a one uh, centimeter square, you actually generate about one gigapascal. And it's so easy to do it inside a lab. So this is done using diamond animals, uh, which are basically uh, gem quality diamonds, which have been truncated here. And uh, but to do ultra high pressures, the diamond actually breaks. So we have to bevel the diamonds, and that's the only way we can go to uh, center of earth pressures. And the first experiment, I'm actually talking about the fundamental idea about what is the uh, how does uh, materials, elemental materials, transform themselves into uh, uh, dense faces, and that. He's, here is a periodic table which says that most of the materials are FCC, BCC, and some of them are HCP, and there are some uh, other uh, crystal structures very rare in the periodic table. So the basic crystal structure is because of the packing fraction. You can see BCC has a, pack, a packing fraction of about 0.68, uh, and uh, FCC has 0.74. In general, the atomic uh, packing factor is uh, 7.4 seven for both uh, FCC and SCP, and BCC is lighter. So it is very uh, well known that BCC and FCC would transform to HCP as the pressure is increased. But interestingly, when you look at the phase diagram of aluminum, you realize that at higher pressures and higher temperatures, BCC is the lowest, uh, I mean, the structure which is stabilized. The, uh, it starts with FCC. If I take a room temperature, I would see that it goes to HCP and then to FCC. And when you are doing such high pressures, you can see the uh, problem if your synchrotron uh, source is not very uh, apt for it, that you will be saturated with most of the gasket peaks as well as your uh, pressure marker peaks than your actual uh, peaks coming from the system. So here it is very difficult to see the HCP peak evolving, but this is the work which was done. Today, we can actually make such tiny samples using fo focused ion beam, uh, which is generally used for TEM measurements nowadays for making laminars. So we use that to drill a hole of about 10 microns. Uh, you can see this is the 10 micron hole in this gasket. And in this, we can actually place the uh, this aluminum foil because we cannot take uh, aluminum powder because it, bur it is uh, pyrophilic. So you take and machine this uh, uh, nice little uh, uh, structures and uh, you can uh, put it inside inside the FESCM itself. And then you go to a synchrotron. This is ESRF where we did this. And this is the beam line maintained by Mohammed, a good friend of mine, where the beam line is actually giving you a focused beam of a one, one micron to one to two micron diameter. And that is there on ID 27. Now it's been changed. Uh, I think uh, the uh, whole system has improved substantially after I had used that. So this is how you would get the diffraction patterns from a very tiny source inside uh, inside a, a, a pressure cell. And you can actually record these uh, ex experiments. Here is an experiment where we have done on aluminum to just show you how beautifully we can get only aluminum and no other peaks coming in if my size of the uh, gasket is very high. And then uh, we go on to see the HCP phase evolving, which was seen earlier. But uh, when you go on higher pressures, we see suddenly the evolution of B uh, BCC phase in this system. And you can see that BCC phase is coming along with the HCP, but you, now you can see that the peak is actually dominated by the gasket material as well uh, in the system. 
So that is the problem when you, uh, you have such, uh, 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 such a high pressure. And this is at 320 gigapascals, and you can see the HCB phase uh, you can actually find out. And this follows the rule, which is HCP to VCC ratio. You can exactly see, and we have got the VCC effect. So basically what happens here is that the HCP to BCC, why is that you are going to an open structure? The reason is that when you have an HCP ABAB structure along the 111 direction, you can see a slight shear force can move the atoms to form a BCC structure. And this is now the 110 of the BCC. It's a beautiful Martinson uh, transition which is happening in the system. And that is the reason why a BCC would be stabilized in the system. We could show that. And again, along with the, the time when we were working, a shock experiment was also done. And they could actually see very, very weak signals, but they could actually see BCC is the phase about to it. So this is what we had actually demonstrated using the synchrotron. Another example of phase diagrams in the uh, material, uh, here is another example of ICE. ICE is a very beautiful, uh, well-studied system because it has a rich phase diagram in the solid phase itself. And interestingly, ammonium fluoride, in fact, is a analogous system to ICE. And then when you look at the phase diagram of ICE and when you look at the phase diagram till now, studied before our study, was showing this. You can see this if you expand it, it is what ammonium fluoride is at. So the question is ammonium fluoride is it uh, ice like? Is it because of the tetrahedral nature? The, the, does the low temperature, uh, high pressure phase follow the ice like behavior and other ammonia analytes? So, we did synchrotron studies at high pressure and temperature as well as low temperature, high pressure Raman to look at this uh, dynamics. So, you can see when you pressurize at very low, uh, at room temperature, you can see that. It at uh, this uh, this goes from a cubic structure. Uh, it goes into a high pressure cubic structure, uh, which remains in the cubic structure itself. Now, when we look at it, very interestingly, the uh, this is the data which is collected for the equation of state. And when you want to fit it, you realize that when you do a DFT calculation, you have to use a higher supercell uh, instead of a cubic uh, cell, and then you have to introduce some. Uh, distortions into the system, and then it can explain much better the system. What I'm saying is that if it is a disordered system, if you see, if I expand the cell, I just bring in a tetragonal uh, distortion into the supercell, and that is what can explain the ammonium fluoride's uh, behavior in the in the equation of state, the deviation at 20, uh, 20 gigapascals. Now, Raman actually shows the three phases at different temperatures and pressures. So you can see hexagonal phase, the one, then romohedral phase and the cubic phase. But once you start going into the higher phase, you start seeing a very nice change happening in the system. And you can see that the Raman actually shows a discontinuity at around 10 GPA. And uh, here uh, you can see a change happening in most of the modes. And there is a strong deviation after 20 GPA, which is also seen. Now, let us look at the line shape of this, uh, of uh, the transverse optics as well as uh, uh, bending mode. So, when we look at the transverse optic mode, uh, you realize that uh, you have, uh, as you increase the, uh, uh, at a given pressure, as you increase the temperature, the width increases. The dark line is for 100 Kelvin, and this is room temperature, the dotted line. You can see the width increases. That is a normal behavior. But as soon as you increase the pressure, and you look at it, for a, a low temperature, you start seeing a broadening. This is not possible to be understood very easily because this is inverse effect, which is seen. At higher pressures, we are seeing that low temperature is going to, uh, uh, is, and also it is splitting. Sorry. It is also splitting at higher pressures. So this is only possible if there is a, a, a some sort of a, a disorder to order transition which is happening in the system. So you have a cubic system which is uh, ordered at lower temperature and higher uh, pressures, it is actually disordered. You can see the FWHM jumps at 20 gigapascals. Now what is the actual thing happening in the system? It's broadening and splitting of the bending mode cannot be done without lowering the symmetry. So it is not cubic, something else is happening. So temperature dependence of the ice also has the same thing as well as your ammonium halides. 
they go from an order disorder transition. You can see in the eyes also is that. So let us look at it uh, in calculations. So you have an ordered cubic structure at low temperature, and the splitting can be generated by lowering the symmetry. So the simplest way is take the cubic structure and then make it tetragonal. Uh, I'm done. Tetragonal uh, distortion into it. The moment you introduce tetragonal distortion, then you can see that the entropy is the same. Enthalpy is the same. So that means this is stabilized. Uh, so this is a tetragonal phase in the, it's not just cubic, it is a tetragonal phase. But if you introduce a dis, uh, disorder into this, then you can see that the enthalpy is higher. So that means at the low temperature, it is actually not cubic, it is actually tetragonal in the circuit. So what is exactly happening now? You can actually summarize, and this is my last slide uh, to tell you what is happening in ammonium fluoride. So here is the temperature study, which we are doing at higher pressure, at low temperature. It goes from hexagonal to a rhombohedral, then to a disordered cubic structure, which is similar to the I7 structure. I7 structure is this, disorder. Now what is happening is, as you lower the temperature, you bring in a, uh, a ordering into the system. And this ordering is leading to a tetragonal phase into this. So there is a strong similarity between all the ammonium halides. In the room temperature, it is not having a, a similarity in the structure with the ammonium halides. But as you pressurize it and lower temperatures, ammonium halides actually behave similarly. similarly. And again, you can see that the three phases of uh, uh, what is there in the ammonium fluoride exactly mimic what the eye structure is there. So based, this is a very, very interesting uh, behavior. Can all tetrahedral molecules uh, show such, uh, especially if they have this difference in the bond structures that ice has, that is two hydrogen bonds are longer and two hydrogen covalent bonds are shorter in the system, such a system will always develop a rich phase diagram in the solid structure. So this is what is the message I would like to leave. Thank you for your attention, and thank you uh, once again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Tanurva. So we have some questions. Uh, few. So uh, is there any questions? Please write, uh, raise the hand or write it in the chat box. Is there a question uh, in the hall or in the YouTube? Okay, so I have one question, Chandrava. Yeah. Uh, if there are no question, so uh, you showed uh, the study about ammonium fluoride, right? So the, I, I followed your work on uh, ammonia and uh, other work. Uh, you predicted their metallic hydrogen. Right. So so how it is different from this the ammonia than ammonium fluoride, basically? So. Okay, uh, so uh, ammonia is different because ammonia, uh, when you look at it, it actually has a, a not a tetrahedral structure. Yes. Uh, and yeah. uh, it is pyramidal. Yeah. And uh, there, uh, the whole uh, effect is because uh, there can be a dissociation of mm. hydrogen. Mm. Nitrogen can be dissociated from the hydrogen. And the metallicity which is going to come from mm. such structures, actually, you go to higher elements. Uh, say uh, silane, right. SiO, H4, or hydrogen uh, sulfide, all of these things are easy to dissociate. Mm. So then the hydrogen is supposed to become the metallic okay. uh, component. And all of this, like lithium, mm. lithium, uh, uh, lanthanum, lanthanum, uh, lanthanum H, yeah. H10, that's a structure. It's a rich in hydrogen. Yeah. All of this, because hydrogen is very difficult mm. to do by itself, people have actually gone for hydrogen rich systems which can dissociate from uh, yeah. to produce hydrogen in high pressure state. Right. So those are the reasons why it becomes metallic. Whereas ammonium fluoride is HF because you can it is not a NH4 plus F. It is a HF plus NH3. Okay. It's a uh, that kind of a structure, okay. unlike the other ammonium. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the one which gives you this asymmetry in the hydrogen bond, I mean tetrahedral structure. Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, asymmetry is the reason why this gives you a rich phase diagram in this okay. Okay, thank you, John Ross. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the excellent talk. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so there is a question uh, by uh, from uh, Gautam Dev Mukherjee uh, from ISR Kolkata. Is there an issue about stress of uh, aluminium at extreme pressures? 
Oh, no. Actually, uh, when you go to the extreme pressures, uh, uh, it is non hydrostatic. It cannot be hydrostatic at all. It will be non hydrostatic completely. Not non hydrostatic, it is quasi hydrostatic. And that is the reason why we took uh, uh, foils, because when you take powder, it will be uh, slightly more different. Uh, you take aluminum foils, and these foils actually, when you apply a stress, um, aluminum has this possibility of gliding over, similar to manganese, uh, magnesium. Uh, all of these things go from a CP structure to BCC. Indium, uh, indium is another example for this. So they all glide through. This is all, and uh, electronically also they say it is because of the presence of the d orbitals going into the uh, valence uh, uh, levels. So that is another reason for this uh, uh, happening in this system. So that is the, uh, the uh, these are, so there is no uh, uh, stress which is different. It is uh, quasi hydrostatic, but you can actually have this uh, uh, happen in this systems only. Not all HCPs would go into a BCC structure. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Chandravas, uh, for the excellent talk. So, we'll move, uh, can somebody? So, uh, we'll uh, move to the next talk uh, by uh, Professor uh, Hans Christian Willy from uh, Desi. Uh, so, uh, he uh, is going to talk about uh, Petra 3 stat status opportunities and and the operation under corona condition. So, uh, uh, Hans. Uh, yes, th thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Can you see my slides? See your slide. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Could you change it to presentation mode? Yeah, I did. It's not coming well, full. It's not? Oh, okay. Then I have to maybe. Presenter view. Presenter view. Please, please remove the is presenter it, view. Is it now like this? Is it better? Ah, yeah. That's good. Now, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation, and I'm going to talk about the Petra C status and uh, opportunities and operation under corona conditions. Um, this is just a little uh, Peter 3 fact sheet, and why many of you know, and uh, Professor Josh already mentioned it, uh, the Peter 3 is uh, the most brilliant third generation synchrotron source. Uh, it's running at 6 GeV, and uh, we are already having a really nice performance in terms of emittance. And uh, we have 23 beam lines in operation and uh, about 5,000 hours of user operation every year. Uh, we are serving uh, different fields of science uh, with uh, methods of the beam lines like scattering, diffraction, spectroscopy, imaging, and also coherence applications. And we have many uh, experiments optimized for different applications, including small foci and large coherence volume. Uh, we, of course, uh, have also uh, some local uh, um, strategic partners who are operating beam lines. And of course, uh, we are very happy also to have this uh, strategic partner, Indian, which is running the Indian virtual beamline. And uh, this is basically what I'm going to talk about also in the next minutes. So, as you know, we are running uh, many, many beamlines in different uh, application fields, uh, scientific areas, uh, experimental areas like diffraction, scattering, spectroscopy, imaging. Of course, I cannot go to all the details here. But uh, of course, uh, you are very, very welcome to contact us if you have any questions, and we will be very happy uh, to um, help you to figure out the best plan for your experiments. What I would like to do is today is uh, maybe to focus a little bit on the new upcoming opportunities and new instruments that will be starting this year. And I will come to this back a little later. Before I do so, I would like to uh, show you a little bit about the operation during the unfortunate uh, corona pandemic uh, times that we are facing it basically started early last year as you all know and actually when this all uh, came to our knowledge we had to start user operation at about uh, 20th of march uh, the entire machine was basically uh, shut down for for a certain time however 
uh, we were really uh, re relatively early restarting the machine because we had uh, immediate requests for corona related experiments. So we restarted the machine on March 31 already and had about an entire month of uh, experiments exclusively related to corona uh, related uh, research questions. Then finally, uh, in early May, we decided to go back in the kind of a reduced uh, safe user operation. And um, we, of course, had to, to adapt a little bit. I come to that in a minute. Um, despite the corona pandemic, the machine in general was doing very well during last year. The average availability basically uh, had a record value of about 99%. And also the mean time between failures is really, really large. So the machine in general was very running very, very nicely. So what did we do? Of course, uh, we had uh, to make sure if we would like to continue serving our user program that we adapt it uh, to the uh, conditions. And uh, so we, um, the realization of the user run since May 2020 was only, be, was only possible uh, due to new, of course, always regularly updated new corona rules. So the first thing that we did, we did not allow for more than three users per experiment anymore. We had a clear corona rules uh, and uh, working rules at Factor 3 and Flash, and everybody had to sign and acknowledge this when starting experiments. And of course, we did as much as possible also home office and uh, people had from time to time also go into quarantine. I'll come to that later again. We also really uh, uh, tried to do as much mail-in service and remote control uh, to, to guarantee safe user operation. Uh, luckily enough, uh, it seems to work and we never had any infection at the VMs so far. So the current rules I would like to uh, remind you, uh, which are really only the current ones, these are really permanently changing and adapting to, of course, to the federal rules in Germany. So we have uh, international users coming from what we now call normal risk areas. They can be released by a negative PCR test after five days on quarantine and work at the beam lines. However, there are new rules uh, just uh, recently introduced where they, that they, the government says that high incident risk areas and areas of variant of concern, which is these kind of mutants of the virus, they really need to stay in quarantine for 14 days. And so far, we, we decided not to offer this uh, 14 days in our daisy guest house due to several reasons. However, uh, the voluntary fast self testing is now being implemented uh, for our, also for our stuff, and uh, the vaccination rate is progressing worldwide. And uh, we are also trying to really enforce our mail and the remote control. So there is hope, and I. I really hope that at some point we can also go back to real normal user operation, even this year, of course. Here's a little bit of, about statistics. So, uh, of course, the, the general operation was uh, was um, yeah, affected by the by the pandemic, and you can see it in the unique user visits. Uh, we had, of course, less than the year before, and also. The general user visits uh, went down. However, um, as I showed before, I didn't say it, but we were running the machine almost the same amount of time as before. However, 600 hours of, of the about reached 4,800 hours were dedicated to corona research. And another thing that, of course, happened is we had to reschedule and uh, on short notice beam time. So many of the beam times that could not be taken by our international uh, partners then actually were scheduled for German users. So you can see that the amount is 74% is an unusual high amount of German users compared to other years. So, and also we decided that, uh, that we can uh, not run the, um, <clears throat> not, uh, let's say, propose to shift all the experiments that have had to be shifted, or had to be canceled further on. We were we scaled you many, many experiments from last year up to this summer. Uh, and now we have to um, go back to the old system that everybody has to apply for beam time because otherwise things get too complicated. 
So what we were doing, we were rescheduling beam times uh, to fill the gaps. We stretched the run period from 2020 until summer 21, as I just said. And of course, we offered mail-in and remote access if possible. Um, we didn't have a call for this reason. We didn't have a call uh, uh, in September 20. Oops, sorry, in September 2020. In fact, we had a mini call for some beam lines where we were worrying that they could not fill all the gaps with the old proposals. <clears throat> and we offered, of course, priority beam time for many experiments to corona visors, which we still do. So the challenge was, of course, to trying to serve the priority access and user programs quota during the corona travel restrictions, and also partly closed labs in the international uh, surrounding and all the other countries. And uh, as you can see, uh, we could only deliver something like 230 shifts in 2020 to uh, the Indian at Daisy Corporation, where about 450s are foreseen. However, we already planned in this year, early this year, up to summer, to schedule another 400, around 480 shifts. So we are really catching up uh, to deliver the number of hours that we are supposed to do. And here's a bit about the call statistics. Last year in the call in March, we got 50 proposals from the India collaboration. In the mini call, it was 16. There were only really few beam lines uh, included in this call. And again, we have more than 50 proposals now from the three, just the call that just closed on March 1st this year. Now let me tell you a little bit about the new instruments coming up. Uh, we have a new project together with the Karlsruhe Institute of technology where uh, a parallel beam imaging um, instrument is uh, being installed, which is a kind of hierarchical uh, imaging instrument. You can do 3D tomography, lamography, and also under mechanical load. And uh, there will be the possibility to do serial tomography and 3D, 4D digital morphology. Some applications are really in the biological uh, research area where you can really go to see, uh, take pictures of from, from full animals down to organs, tissues, and to cells. And uh, we are very, very looking forward to this, uh, uh, to this opportunity, which is currently installed at Beeman 23. And uh, as it is a really a huge, uh, I think 80 meters long instrument, I'd like to show you the installation. We really have to open the roof for that and bring it in with the cranes. You see, this is a rather high wheeled instrument. Uh, uh, luckily enough, everything went very well and the instrument is now being uh, installed. Another uh, new opportunity is the high pressure research at P61, where we have a large volume press uh, serving mostly earth and material science. Uh, this has, has been going into user operation in uh, 20, 20, uh, 2020 in August. And, um, is open for users as well. One of the instruments that uh, should have already started last year was a little bit delayed due to, due to the um, um, corona crisis is our small angle X-ray scattering beam like P62. You can see the instrument here. It really has a really long uh, vacuum tube. And um, actually the monochromator is now being uh, set up at DAISY. It should have been delivered already last year. And this beamline is actually taking advantage of the enhanced sucks contrast by using absorption edges, the so-called um, anomalous uh, small angle scattering. And the first beam is now coming in, in uh, 2021 in spring, and the first users are expected in summer. Another instrument uh, that we are building right now is the P66 time resolved luminescence spectroscopy beamline. This is an instrument really working in the UV regime, uh, very low energy uh, optical excitations. And it is basically in, has been installed in the, in the Petra tunnel, just in this shutdown in winter. As you can see here, the beam is going up from a banging magnet with a mirror and goes up to a, to a special place uh, on, on, in the experimental hutch, which is basically mounted on the ring tunnel itself. And the first beam expected is uh, summer 2021. And the first users we are expecting towards the end of 2021. And let me now come a little bit to uh, our, of course, uh, already mentioned project uh, to build Petra 4, 
the ultimate 3D X-ray microscope, uh, how we are calling it. Um, this is basically a, pro, uh, a, a project that is already running and the conceptual design report has been finished uh, more than a year ago. And if you would like to receive a copy, you can just co uh, contact us or contact the P4 project office at DAISY and uh, we can send you a hard copy and of course also a PDF if you like. Here's the timeline of the entire picture core project. Uh, as I said, the CDR file is, is over. We have the report ready and we are basically in the middle of the paper for TDR, the technical design report phase. And what we're actually doing at the very moment is uh, that we have been collecting the scientific instrument proposals uh, uh, until end of last year, basically. We also had several user workshops where many of you, I'm sure, also participated. Uh, we collected 159 uh, scientific instrument proposals. We sent them out to 146 referees for a scientific review, which has been finished. And at the, the very moment, we are actually working on the first suggestion of the Beamline portfolio that will be uh, presented to our photon science committee uh, in April. And after that, uh, we will define the beamline portfolio, um, uh, let's say, up to the end of the year, getting the feedback from the PSC, and then we will start the beamline technical design basically next year. And that's basically everything I wanted to tell you. And uh, we are looking forward to have you again here in Hamburg uh, for doing your experiments. And uh, um, thank you very thank much. You very much. Thank you, Christian. So uh, let us see that uh, if you have some questions in chat box or in YouTube. Do you have any question? Okay. So uh, do you have any question in the hall? Okay. Uh, so there are no questions. So let's thank uh, 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 Christian again for the excellent presentation. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much for joining. So. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Jaydeep Basu from Physics Department of IIC Bangalore. So, uh, is he here? Yeah. So, Jaydeep, could you please uh, share your slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, he is going to talk about viscosity and uh, fragility of confined polymer nanocomposite tail or two interfaces. So, Jaydeep, you have 13 minutes and two minutes will keep for discussion. Can you see? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can see your slide, but uh, go to the presentation mode. So it's still in uh, normal PowerPoint mode, but if you can go to the presentation mode. I go for full screen. Full screen. Just F five. Uh, can you see now? Yeah, but it's not in presentation mode. But okay, it, it, I think. There was a yeah, this is the icon. Yeah, and now, no, <laughs> no, if five is large, then it will not go in presentation mode. So, prefer to go for PDF. If you so have, I will try, I'll try to share the presentation. I'll try sharing the screen. Yeah, so but, if you put PDF, probably it will go in, but it may take time to convert to PDF now, I think. Yeah. No, share the full screen. But uh, share full screen. Don't share only the PPT. Yeah. Share the full screen. Yeah, done. Yeah, now it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, can you see the next slide? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, uh, thank the the organizers for uh, uh, giving me an opportunity to uh, you know discuss uh, some some results. Uh, of course, these were uh, you know based on experiments. I think we have not gone there. 
uh, for I, I think close to three years now. I think 2018 is when at least I remember going there last. So it's been really a long, long time, and you know we we look forward to uh, you know some experiments uh, you know maybe later this year. Uh, but but we will see. So anyway, so this is something uh, that I want to talk about uh, today. So uh, since uh, time is short, I will quickly come to uh, the question. So uh, in a very brief uh, aspect of uh, you know what polymer nanocomposites are, essentially they are mixtures of you know, particles and, and, and polymers, which I guess both these aspects people know. What is uh, specific in the system that we think at is we, we try to make it miscible and so that you know you can go to very high fractions and then you know then you can basically enhance the functionality of of the materials essentially the functionality will come essentially from the particles and the polymer has certain properties and we utilize a combination of that and i, mean, I don't need to say there are you know, several applications already actually there are many applications where this is uh, actually used uh, in, in in different uh, you know aspects uh, some examples are are, are given here um, let me grab the pointer yeah so some applications are given here uh, but uh, our perspective was more in terms of you know how one can uh, tune the uh, you know the thermal and mechanical properties of the systems which becomes very important in terms of the uh, processability uh, of these materials so uh, if, if these are not uh, thermally or mechanically stable then no matter what application you have in mind they will not work so so in the process we we encountered several you know uh, you know very fundamental aspects uh, which uh, i'll hope you know uh, hope i can kind of uh, explain and convince uh, the audience in the next 10 minutes or so so uh, basically uh, i i uh, i the two terms we used uh, in, in the title viscosity and fragility i think uh, uh, at least the viscosity is definitely uh, you know well known to uh, the audience so this is a very well known plot uh, of uh, you know typical of, of glass formers uh, looking at the viscosity as a function of of temperature uh, or inverse temperature scale to tg and uh, uh, you know to cut a long story short so there are different uh, materials uh, you know uh, and we work with one such glass former which is a polymer but there are different materials and uh, the sum which basically as you can see on this log uh, plot uh, of 1 over t shows this and of linear behavior, which are called strong. Uh, for example, uh, silica is, is one such example. But there are a lot of other materials which show this fragile behavior. That means you know they have a uh, they have something called fragility, and you can see this kind of highly nonlinear curve uh, in this expression. And uh, the fragility usually will be given by I mean this this is a mathematical form, but essentially you take a, a slope at at this point approaching uh, Tg, and uh, you are looking at uh, temperatures which are you know, uh, you know, in this uh, regime, which are uh, greater than Tg. So, so basically, viscosity, you know, kind of diverges or goes to extremely high value here uh, at or around Tg, and it, it, you know, jumps by several orders of magnitude. So, the other aspect that uh, that uh, uh, we will we will uh, encounter here is in terms of uh, the confinement effect, and I, I cannot go into the details of this field which you know has been actively pursued in the last you know at least uh, three decades uh, that when uh, one has a, a, a thin material which is uh, you know really uh, confined uh, then you start seeing deviation in many material properties so here is one example uh, where one is talking about the you know the adsorbed layer so there is some sort of an interfacial layer uh, in, in in a polymer but you can see similar behavior for example if you if you measure uh, the glass transition temperature of the system, and uh, one tries to basically correlate those behavior with uh, trends uh, in in such properties. Uh, what so this is for pure polymer, but in 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 the in the nanocomposite, or at least in the one that uh, we are interested in, for for that matter, for any uh, nanoparticle polymer composite interface, uh, there is another interface which is now the interface between the particle and the polymer. And uh, normally, for good dispersion, you want to kind of remove the enthalpic effect. That means if you don't have any enthalpic interaction, then you can prevent the aggregation and stuff like that, or minimize it. And uh, whereas you, you know, but then what happens is what people realized is that one way of doing this is by you know kind of putting same polymer here as you have in the matrix, and so the enthalpic effect goes away. But there is something called entropic effect because this uh, polymer surface here and the configuration 
is different from what is there in the matrix and that leads to a uh, you know, very interesting uh, so the the, the uh, I mean, which is essentially driven by entropy and then the entropic uh, compatibility parameter is something which uh, you know basically uh, it can be you know you, for for ease of understanding one can define in terms of the graph molecular weight with the matrix uh, molecular weight or the size basically and we had shown earlier that uh, if you look at the interfacial thickness that is in the matrix and, and this graph chain then that will scale this parameter f so that is something that you know we have as a, as a tuning parameter and this is something which can be varied independent of the of the thickness Unable to hear. Uh, is it a problem with all? Uh, yeah, yeah, he is frozen. Yeah, we are calling him. Yeah. yeah. As if you are not audible, we are unable to follow you. Yes, yes, he is not audible, but uh, where is he? Surprisingly, he is visible. There's a problem of Jaydeep's audio, it looks like. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, can you hear us? Hello? Hello? Jai? Hello? Mm. I think it's microphone. Yeah. Not microphone, mic. Let's go give him a call. 
Yeah, yeah, we have to call him already. Converse. One more thing. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, already time is up also. Till what is the sound? Okay, so uh, uh, sorry for this. Uh, so uh, there is uh, some connectivity problem with Jaydeep. So we'll go to the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Kudipto uh, Rai uh, from uh, UGC Day DAE, and uh, he is going to talk about the electronic structure of complex metal. So uh, Kudipto, uh, please uh, share your slide. So now it's sound has gone. So if you are, uh, uh, so uh, I think, yeah. Now you are, un uh, you have to unmute. Please start. Oh, oh, oh. It's from. It's Imagine. So, uh, 
in, in that case, uh, so uh, we are going for the next speaker, like we will come back to you again. We go, we go to the next speaker, and uh, the next speaker is Professor, uh, please mute. Yeah. So uh, the next speaker is Professor Sebastian Peter from GNCSR, and he is going to talk about exams as a tool to characterize the structure of the material and reaction mechanism in fuel cell CO2 reduction and hydrogen production. Sebastian, you have 13 minutes and uh, uh, two minutes for uh, discussion. Nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. It's Can talk here is very so can you hear me huh? all right so good afternoon good evening all dignitaries here, all participants. So it's my pleasure to share my research activities. First of all, I would like to thank uh, JNCSR and uh, DST Nano Missions for you know, for providing a wonderful platform to do I mean, you know, various research activities at uh, um, Singleton facilities. In this particular talk, I would uh, like to share um, what are the activities we have done at Petra only uh, last several years. Uh, myself, Sebastian Peter. Um, and uh, uh, so today the title of my talk is uh, Extracts as a tool to characterize the structure of the materials and uh, uh, reaction mechanism in fuel cell CO2 reduction and hydrogen production. So I go through a, in a glimpse of what we have done so far uh, in the direction of excerpts. I won't focus on the fundamental part of you know the, the chemistry in detail. So videos off one second here can i uh, Okay, okay, fine. fine. Sorry, Sorry for, for the delay. delay. Yeah. So, um, in our group, we do basically a, um, um, basically we do a sustainable energy cycle. So we work in the area of water splitting, fuel cell, and CO2 reduction. Um, we um, so just combine all together. I mean, you know, develop a sustainable cycle. So, but here, I mean, how exhaustion we efficiently utilize to develop the technology. Um, in a broad scale, um, in X, in excerpts, as you know, I mean, excerpts is a very powerful technique. Um, it can be used for various, uh, uh, the, you know, understanding of various part of, you know, the uh, materials design strategies. So, uh, as you see that, uh, uh, it can be used for, uh, uh, understanding the oxidation stage and how the charge transfer is uh, happening and it can be used to, I mean, uh, propose, you know, whether it's a single atom or, you know, metallic system. Etc. So we can be also understand the coordination environment. If any 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 deficiency can be tuned by I mean you know uh, you know probing at the local structure, whether it is a forming in the nano cluster and then how is the bonding and you know, some I mean, bond distances are varied and then bond distances uh, introduce some I mean, in various concepts like lattice strain. I mean you know um, frustration in the system that can induce I mean in, in enhancing the activity. So all this, I mean, fundamental concept of chemistry we have uh, well used 
and excerpts used as a, a complementary technique come I mean, sometimes sometimes you know it is used as a uh, uh, in situ technique understanding the mechanism in depth so here the uh, you can see that when uh, different types of you know the nano uh, material synthesis strategy um, we develop in the form of nano structuring in various uh, uh, dimensionality different types of supports i mean when the support and then uh, active metal species i mean there is a um, you know the interface i mean the how the activity is actually performing and different morphology and different polymorphs adsorbate partial alloys intercalation etc and etc so all these i mean parameters can be all this i mean uh, uh, you know can be monitored by excerpts so we have written an article in a progress holistic chemistry so you can see that i just want to give an a, a layman's language i mean you uh, treat a metal one and metal two a metal a and metal b the, this can form, form different types of systems. So, I mean, can bimetallic for solid solution or alloy, intermetallic. When you use the laboratory XRD, I mean, you will understand, you know, how the broad structure of this one. Uh, however, I mean, um, probably if you go to, I mean, in detail, some characterization, you can understand some spectroscopy. But um, what exactly happening at the atomic scale in nanoscale, um, XR for exchange can give, I mean, uh, uh, you know, some information. So, um, I, I talk about one example in each and brief. Um, so, this is one example in the direction of CO2 reduction. This paper just published, I mean, one month back in ACS Energy Letter. So, here, uh, an operanda generated catalyst nickel 3 indium as an efficient catalyst uh, for the conversion of CO2 to methanol. You can see that when you take in metal nickel and uh, indium and you mix together without understanding what actually happening in the solid state chemistry, you may end up in. 1 is to 1, 2 is to 1, 3 is to 1, and 2 is to 3, and 3, 7 is to 3. Um, but you don't know exactly. I mean, XRD will give, okay, what kind of atomic arrangement. So, what we have done, we synthesize, and eventually it ended up in nickel 7, indium 3. And the indium is famous for, I mean, the methanol production. Nickel is famous for, I mean, you know, sub, uh, uh, you know good adsorption of, you know, CO2 molecule. So, we have to probe this one, you know, in our uh, uh, CO2 reduction facility. And then what we can see that, it gives, I mean, very good conversion in the range of 18 to 20 percentage. And uh, for the best part, actually, we could able to reduce the pressure from 50. That is a uh, state of, you know, the performance, I mean, at the current scenario. And then we could reach uh, down uh, 20 per pressure. And while doing an each step I mean, pressure, we have taken the sample and then did the postmortem study in XRD and then understanding the phase changes. And you can see that five bar, to, I mean, you know, this 50 bar, there is a uh, transition or transformation of the phase nickel 7 indium 3 into nickel 3 indium and uh, this actually i mean confirming that in our prando uh, generation of a new catalyst so where i just tried to fundamental i um, mean co2 chemistry co2 um, is a linear molecule and uh, carbon is actually electropositive and oxygen is electronegative because of the electronegativity difference there is a slight charge transfer of you know the carbon uh, I mean, oxygen to carbon that create actually um, oxygen is nucleophilic and carbon is an electrophilic. Because of this nature, actually, I mean, you, when you design the catalyst, I mean, uh, you have to have the catalyst a mixture of electron rich and electron deficient metal. And this uh, will change the mechanistic pathway. I mean, depends on what desired I mean, product you are looking for. Nickel is very famous for as yes, a metal for methane formation, but when it is forming nickel to indium, it is actually, I mean, converting methanol. So, what we have used, I mean, we have done in you know, XPS analysis, DFT calculations, and uh, in addition, and we have done XPFs, I mean, at uh, the uh, Petra 65, Vimalayam 65, you can see that there is a charge transfer, there is a uh, quite, I mean, difference in the, I mean, the absorption energy and then Sains data, and there is a charge transfer from indium to uh, nickel confirmed by Sains here, as you see that one. And there is, I mean, you know, white line intensity is actually also um, going down. It's uh, in a city is actually strongly suggesting that when there is a charge transfer, which is strongly suggesting, I mean, this uh, uh, induced uh, uh, in situ generation of electro, uh, uh, electron rich and electron deficient species, and that actually favoring the mechanistic pathway in different ways. So, based on that, when we propose the mechanism uh, combining all the technique together. And another uh, 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 technology we are developing in the labs, well, we develop the electrode material for anode and cathode oxidation and reduction reaction respectively. And uh, uh, one such example, ex uh, uh, just one month back, again, we published in ACS catalysis. 
and uh, what we have done here uh, palladium bi palladium 3 bi catalyst we have synthesized and then you know and, uh, uh, milled in at a different uh, time period in a ball miller and as you can see that one two hours four hours six hours eight hours and ten hours and then you know so the idea was actually to generate the nanoparticle but during this i mean the jump nanoparticle so you can see, see that there is a shift in the onset potential and halfway potential in the oxygen reduction reaction and then you know so we try to understand so one could uh, assess that one probably the particle size is reducing even exhaust can also prove that i mean in you know, a particle size reduction because the surface oxid i mean coordination uh, can be i mean now uh, uh, you know removed i mean then that can uh, end up in an average coordination environment will be much less in the case of smaller nanoparticle so we also found that i mean uh, the increased absorption energy enhances hybridization generating a compressive strain and you can see that the distances radial distances calculate from the exhaust fitting and a different i mean you know the milling time and the eight hours milling time you can see that there is a, a drop in the radial distances and the coordination number that induces a strain within the system that enhances the activity as you see that specific activity is highest for the eight hour sample so this is well complemented by our uh, theoretical studies where we introduce the strain um you know the uh, induce the strain within the system in the dft calculation then we understood that strain is the major role in enhancing the activity if you go to the anode side we have a classical example um, uh, you know we propose a sacrificial protection in action where there is a palladocyte i mean in a mineral that only found in uh, uh, only find in actually in brazil palladium 17 se 15 so we synthesize this uh, um, you know the material in lab and then we characterize i mean various method and then did the uh, 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 oxygen reduction test actually and ethanol oxidation also but um, what we are pointing actually, I mean, here, yeah, here is oxidant reduction reaction. So here you can see that when there is a uh, cycling process happen and the 50K cycle, actually you can see that um, there is no change in that is I mean, a kind of a record uh, data. So here, uh, what we notice that when what happened, I mean, up to, even up to 50K cycle, uh, uh, there is a CV and each cycle or any every 10 cycles and we have taken, you can see that selenium oxide formation is happening and there is a shift in the uh, uh, so, so, for, for both i mean you know uh, forward and backward i mean you know, so in the cv cycle and uh, upon you know cycling in this uh, activity is slightly improving and then keep the stability as good as i mean and this uh, mechanism uh, is also similar as platinum in a close in the stuffle slope is close to platinum like activity so we uh, again we uh, propose the mechanism what is happening when it is uh, when it is in the uh, sorry, uh, palladium 17 sc 15 uh, if you consider this is a structure upon treatment with the you know the, in the harsh condition palladium i mean selenium slowly etch out of the system because it's i mean as you see in this equation and then you know selenium is leached out of that system and then it is i mean it also form a protective layer at the surface of the palladium. So basically it is acting as a protection layer to keep in a palladium uh, not to, um, you know, so, uh, you know, decompose. So, so, I mean, and that we keep the activity over a long period of time. So what happened here, uh, the selenium also jetching, we confirm with um, an ICP analysis, I mean, slowly we can see. So we have done this experiment in uh, XAPS. Uh, P64 at that time, and then what we can see that there is a shift in palladium 17 SC15 in uh, uh, you know this uh, absorption energy, and you can see that uh, this is a linear edge, and there is a charge a positive oxidation. Yes, uh, oxidation of uh, uh, there is a formation of a positive oxidation state. I mean in the active sites of the palladium, and this also we have done with the palladium 17. I mean what you call exhaust data. There is no uh, much change in the coordination environment, I mean, upon that one. So we have also done that in situ exhaust studies set up in uh, at the beam line 64. And this is a setup we have developed at there, I mean, during the experiment. And what we, I mean, I just, I mean, give the result here, the coordination uh, number of uh, selenium, selenium remains the same, but I mean, the coordination, I mean, selenium, palladium remains the same, and then selenium, selenium decreases from 6.72 to 2.71 confirm that selenium is changing into the solution. This we have done, I mean, under, you know, uh, potassium hydroxide. We dipped the electrode in the potassium hydroxide and we just take it and then do the experiment and then, and then we found this difference. So, 
At the interest of the time, I'm skipping here, but I just want to say that on the extension of this work in hydrogen production and where we found that when copper actually introduced an inverse strain within the system that we have monitored uh, by um, monitored by uh, exabs, where you can see that the palladium exhibit many oxidation change between zero to two plus and selenium oxidation change. You can see that there is no different oxidation change. And this one is published on SS Energy Letter. I just, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, happy that I mean our two works actually highlighted in the Petra News last two years, 2018 and 2019, and these are the, um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the, you know, news came into the Petra News. And uh, finally, I would like to see that I mean, you know, we have around, two, I mean, 21 publications so far. We have published uh, by using the access facility at Petra. Um, and uh, and you can see that in the the trend we have um, um, in including I mean six under review uh, we have around 28. So thanks for the great support and it's a wonderful facility. I mean those who are listening, uh, I would say one of the best in the world. I mean in terms of the exhaust facility, my, my experience. So I mean you should definitely use this facility. And uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, all the people in involved, uh, Professor Sienna Rao for this. Uh, a great initiative and JNCS and Department of Science and Technology, uh, Government of India for the financial support and uh, all the beamline scientists actually supported us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. So, uh, we have uh, some question if there are a few. So uh, please uh, raise the hand or type it in the chat box. Can you hear me, Kanishka? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I'll come. Uh, I'll come to you. No, no. I just well, I'm checking my microphone. That was a check. Yeah, we can hear you. Clearly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, any questions in the hall? Is there a question in YouTube? Okay. Okay. So, Asian, thank you for excellent talk. So, uh, uh, we'll go to the next talk. Uh, the one question from yeah. Abe. yeah, so there is a question in chat box for Sebastian. Did you measure measure the age of indium or uh, uh, for nickel indium alloy? Yes, yeah. Rafri asked the same question. Thank you very much. Uh, so we measured this one, so we could not find any shift in the indium edge uh, in nickel 3 India. So actually what happened, I mean, nickel seven indium three transformed into nickel three indium. So there is a, there is a, a phase transformations completely, but the oxidation changes I mean, did not happen. The same question we faced, yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Sebastian. So let's thank uh, Sebastian again, and we go uh, to uh, Professor Jadip Boshu from IIC. So Jadip, please uh, share your slide. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, please share the slide. Yeah, yeah great. Can you see the slide? Yeah, 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 yeah clear. Okay, so I will start from here, I, I guess. And just uh, you uh, give me like a minute or so warning before I, I should stop. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah otherwise, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, so I will just take a step back. So I just was talking about, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, the experiment where we are basically trying to look at, uh, you know, the possibility of this, this interfacial uh, segregation and also a competition between this. So we are weighting both this interface as well as uh, this uh, interfacial layer by uh, basically controlling the confinement. So yeah. um, these are measurements for the different uh, um, thickness of the, of, the, of the films that we had. And uh, they fit this, this, this line is basically expected for capillary wave and roughly, you know, the, the mm. fit looks good. Mm. And, uh, mm. expected uh, expected uh, variation in, uh, in, in the rate uh, with thickness as the thickness uh, decreases, uh, the, the rate also also decreases, which is what uh, 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 one would expect. 
So from this, uh, is, I mean, to, uh, you know, basically to cut a long story short, one, what one can do is one can extract the viscosity. And then, then this measurement, this sort of measurement, this is at a fixed temperature. You can do this uh, over a different, uh, over a range of temperature. And uh, when you do that over a range of temperature, then you can also uh, essentially extract uh, apart from viscosity, you can also extract uh, the fragility. But uh, the, the crucial thing that uh, you know one, one observes is that, for example, if you look at viscosity as a function of thickness, so when, at, when you have a thicker film, then this, this higher F, this, this is higher, whereas the lower F, uh, that means this is incompatible entropically and this is more compatible. You see the switchover happening uh, as you go to lower thickness. So you see that here it starts off higher and here it becomes lower. Uh, and so, basically, uh, if you look at uh, interfacial layer thickness now, uh, you see that that is something which is, is increasing. That is in proportion, of course, in proportion to the thickness. So that is there is normalized to the total thickness, but definitely you see that this is something which which increases as you go to lower thickness, as as we discussed earlier. Now, what we did is, I mean, to specifically probe the role of this uh, interfacial layer as well. We actually probed uh, something whereby you can, by varying the, uh, you know, this incident angle, you are able to probe surface or interfacial, uh, that is modes which are more surface confined versus uh, looking at dynamics from the surface versus looking at dynamics which is coming more from within the within the film because in, this interfacial absorption of the film is happening near the substrate. So when we do that, we see that uh, in, in this case, if I highlight, you see that the rate here is actually faster. So this is measuring the surface dynamics. This is measuring the bulk dynamics for the same film at the same temperature. And you see that in this case, the interfacial thickness uh, as we measured is, is, is larger. If you look at this case where that thickness is negligible or very small, then you don't see the surface bulk effect. So that's very clear that what we was, what uh, I, I was showing here, this is really uh, affected by the, the presence of this layer. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, then what uh, uh, one one is observing, if I if I you know, basically try to summarize in this in this plot, is that you see this correlation. So you see a correlation between viscosity, and this is across all these samples, and uh, including the the pure polymer film. There is no particles in that. You see, we tend to see a certain correlation. In other words, you can control the viscosity by controlling the, the interfacial thickness. So, so uh, even if, irrespective of what the value of F is, there is an additional parameter which is actually controlling the viscosity. On the other hand, if you look at uh, also another parameter, which is, for example, fragility, at the interfacial uh, thickness, you see that that also has a dependence on this interfacial thickness. So there is viscosity, there is fragility. And here you see that generally it tends to, as, as it, this becomes, higher, that means interfacial thickness becomes higher, your fragility is going down. This effect is stronger in the polymer, but it is a little bit more subdued, but nevertheless, you can see it. So, so basically, what, what this tells us is that essentially, you know, uh, what we have looked at is, uh, we have two parameters, that is how the interfa interfacial width or the interfacial layer around a particle, that when you vary, versus when you vary the interfacial uh, adsorbed layer uh, at the interface between the polymer and the substrate, uh, you have uh, these two basically as control norms for varying the viscosity and the fragility of these films. And that is therefore very, very sort of uh, uh, critical in understanding what happens to, you know, this sort of coatings and when you think of in application. So this uh, is, is the work which uh, in the in the DAISY photon science report uh, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I will summarize uh, by, you know, restating whatever I, I mentioned uh, that essentially this F, which is the interface between the particle and the, the matrix and the H, which is between the film and, and the substrate, you are able to show, we are able to show how you can control this. So if you, if you fix uh, H, then by varying F, you can control viscosity or fragility, or if you fix F by varying, varying H uh, interface, you can control this. So that, that is something that comes out from this. Uh, there is another piece of work. I mean, we, we don't have time to discuss. So this is something which came out, but this is all data essentially coming from our work done uh, you know, before uh, 2018. And I must uh, you know, uh, acknowledge uh, the, the people who are you know, kind of primarily responsible. Uh, Nafisa here, uh, 
uh, Nimi, uh, 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 and, and uh, their current affiliations are already there. She's actually now just joined in, in Daisy as a postdoc along with uh, 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 a position at the University of Zegan. And uh, Shiva Surinder is now currently a professor, assistant professor at IIT Kanpur. And of course, Mikhail Sprung, uh, you know, our old friend and P10. And Aparna is a new student who has uh, been starting. And of course, funding agencies are, are very important. And, you know, with that, I will thank and I will uh, end this. Sorry for all this mix up with the microphone. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let's have some questions. So uh, please type your question in the chat box. To so, uh, so there is a question, uh, how to ensure the unif uniformity of the polymer layer? Jaydi, there is a question for you. Hello? Jaydi? So uh, probably Joydeep can reply uh, in the chat box. Again, there is a question from Ravi Broto. Is there any influence of the solvent that you are using uh, to cast the flings? So are you there with us? Uh, uh, you know, basically, uh, wash out the film. When you wash out the film, you see that there is a remaining layer which is there. And that you can easily image with AFM or any other technique. And so there are multiple ways you can uh, uh, estimate this presence of this. So non-invasive, invasive, both methods are uh, <coughs> estimate. So it seems to be fairly uniform as far as I can tell. Um, the solvent, uh, yeah, so solvent we have not uh, changed. It's the same for uh, all the systems. So we are not comparing uh, the system to the solvent. But I think that is an important point, which is standard. Uh, the processes we follow in terms of annealing and, 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 and so on and so forth, the post processing after film preparation. So, all those have been taken care uh, in this study, and anyway, we have reported all those quite extensively in your earlier work. So thank you, thank you, Jadip. So we have to, uh, yeah. So there are questions in the chat box. You can answer them directly. So yes. uh, due to shortage of time, we'll, uh, we'll go to the next talk. Thank you. So thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Sudip Roy Verma from UGC DAE, and he is going to talk about electronic structure of complex metal. Sudip please share the slide. Yeah. Now, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Very clear. I am sorry. I had a problem with the microphone, and yeah. that's why this uh, noise is coming. Uh, okay, I'll share the slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the slides are not visible yet. Huh? I have one. Yeah, yeah, it is. Is it visible yeah, now? now? Yeah, it's fine now. Okay. So my talk is on electronic structure of complex metals, and uh, I am from UGCDA Consortium Indore. Uh, this work has been uh, done mainly by uh, my students so who went to uh, Petra for the measurements, Chubham, uh, Pampa, and Vipin. And the samples were given by uh, Nobuhisa Fujita and uh, Deguchi did uh, the specific heat measurements, and Andre helped us in the beam time during the experiments. The older work that we did earlier, and a part of it I will discuss in this talk, is uh, has been done by my former students, as well as uh, the theory part was uh, supported by Marian Kraichi and, um, and Marek, and the beam time in ESRF was supported by Rajput and Zegenhagen. And samples, several samples we got from uh, these persons here. And of course, I would like to thank the DST Daisy collaboration and all the people who are involved uh, in the organization is of this workshop.
Uh, so, uh, is it okay? okay? Now, is the second slide showing up? No. Yeah, now it's fine. I think it's slow a little bit from your end. It is slow, yes, it is slow from our end. So, uh, by complex metals here, we will discuss approximants. Approximants are basically conventional crystals with periodic order, wrong range periodic order, but they have very large unit cells. And uh, they have local compositions which are and local atomic arrangements that are similar to the crystals, uh, quasi crystals, and uh, their structures can be solved by uh, normal diffraction techniques. So, if you compare, the, for example, the surface uh, reciprocal lattice as we find by LEED or by ETM, if you look at the um, reciprocal lattice points, in the quasi crystals, you can see the beautiful five-fold order, whereas in case of the approximants, you do not see five-fold order. And uh, so that is uh, the major difference between the approximants and the quasi crystals. And for example, we studied uh, these approximants which, where we have aluminum, palladium, and the manganese of the quasi crystal has been replaced by chromium and iron. So, chromium and iron, as you can see, are the two elements on the two sides of manganese in the periodic table. So, by this way, we keep the E by A ratio similar between the quasi crystal and the, the E by A ratio has important significance in these systems in the stabilization of these materials. So, uh, to understand what are approximants and their relation to quasicrystals, this is the Fibonacci series that is well known, one for one-dimensional quasicrystals, where you can see that if this series goes to infinity, then between long and short and uh, so on, then it is a quasicrystal. On the other hand, if that uh, is terminated, for example, we'll talk about two by one approximant, three by two approximants. So that would mean that uh, we have three long and one short, and that is repeating. A eight by five approximant will mean that we have eight long and five shorts, and then that is repeating. So as these numbers grow, that would mean that we are getting to more and more bigger and bigger approximants. And if this goes to infinity, then we reach the ratio between these two numbers to tau, which is called the golden mean. And that is a perfect quasi-crystal, one-dimensional perfect quasi-crystal. So, the quasi-crystals has been related to the a minimum found around the DOS near the Fermi level, which has been called a pseudo-gap. And this has been related to a perfect matching of the, the pseudo-gap arises because of the Brillua zone and the, and, the, and the matching between the pseudo Brillua zone and the Fermi surface at specific E by A ratios. And this is known as the Hume Rothery me mechanism. And it is related to the clusters, which are all as a very close to spherical symmetry, which co comprises of the uh, comprises the quasi crystals. But so pseudo gap has been predicted theoretically expected. But when we did low energy photo emission, uh, we did earlier some work and there is work from other groups also. What was found is that actually near the Fermi edge, this small dip was uh, assigned to a pseudo gap. But if you look at the temperature variation of the Fermi edge, one found that it is actually a, a clear cut Fermi edge, like a metallic Fermi edge. So there was a hint of a weak possible pseudo gap. And then the reason for that was clear from our later work that the surface of the quasi crystal in case of ALP DMN comprises of metal, which is mostly aluminum metal on the surface. So it is aluminum rich surface. We compared it with aluminum metal and showed that the surface is much more metallic than the bulk. And that explained why the low energy photo emission, which is surface sensitive, could not give, rise to give correct results. On the other hand, if you look at DFT, yeah, okay. So you see here, there was cause of quasi crystals here because everybody does DFT of approximants and imagines that these are actually quasi crystals. So these are all approximants. And you can see that the size of the approximants are increasing. This is a work by Marianne Kreitchi from long back. 
And as the size of the approximant is increasing, the deep of the pseudo gap is increasing. And this, this is the Fermi level. And so, so the approximants themselves also show a pseudo gap, but uh, nobody has done a real quasi-periodic structure because band theory depends on block theorem, which does not hold for quasi-periodic structures, which do not have translational order. So what motivated us to do the, do the XPS studies is that to compare the properties of the approximants with the quasi-crystals, see if there is any difference because the theory cannot do the quasi-crystals and uh, to see how the pseudo gap behaves and we see how the bulk electronic structure evolves and that's why we do the hack space because from low energy photo emission there was not much information that we got but it has its own challenges doing quasi crystals because these are extremely reactive this is aluminium on the surface and it forms a native oxide layer which is under angstrom's thick and very quickly it can form a thick oxide layer and that's why we have to cleave these quasi crystals under ultra high vacuum. That's why we have to go to the beam line almost a week before so that we can do the vacuum and do the measurements in a much better vacuum conditions than is normal users. So, this is a typical survey scan of AL. And if you look at these nice peaks, these are all there. But our interest is in this small, small which is called the valence band. And this valence band, because that's why it requires high brilliance of Petra, and this is a typical valence band. And you can see this valence band has a peak which is related to the palladium 4D states. And if you look at this part here, you can see that this is coming down, the intensity is coming down as you change the photon energies. So of course, these two are at low photon energies, not done at Petra, compared to the um, Compared to the um, high photon energy data, you see that as you do, uh, you use the high photon energy, the intensity is coming down. And what is the reason for that? So if you look at that particular region, which requires high stability, because this is the bulk photo emission, and if if it it is shifted from the Fermi level only by uh, some couple of tens of milli electron volts. So, if, so we need a very stable beam time, beam line, and that's why Petra is well also quite useful because it works on the top up mode. And this is the Fermi edge of gold, and you can see that between the even the bulk and the surface, there is a difference in the spectral shape. So we looked at this spectral shape, look at it very carefully, and we do all uh, different kinds of data analysis and extract the shape of the uh, the suppression. And, we, and if you see the blue curve here, this is what was measured by low energy photo emission, helium-1, helium-2. And this is what we measured for the LPDM and using, using hard X-ray photo emission. So this showed that actual that shape of the pseudo gap, which is much deeper than what is in the surface, can be probed by uh, hard X-ray photo emission. So after establishing this, and okay, this is for ALC UFP, and here we showed that ALC UFP, the pseudo gap is even more pronounced. So after establishing this uh, through this work here uh, in 2012, uh, then we went on to do other quasi crystals like ZNMG DY, which have little less resistivity, which are not so resistive as ALC UFE. And so there is a find a nice correlation that we established between the depth of the pseudo gap, which is given by the increasing number of uh, increasing value of CL and with the resistivity, as you can see here. So, so as, the, as the depth of the pseudo gap increases, the resistivity increases, the resistivity shows a negative TCR, which itself is intriguing in case of the quasi crystals. So the high order application approximants, which I wrote in the title as complex metals. Uh, these, what we studied is ALPD MOFE and ALPD CRFE. So this is their XRD pattern. They look very similar. So they are isostructural. And uh, uh, the group who made these uh, systems for the first time, they determined their structure. As you can see, it has a lattice constant of 40 angstroms, and it has 4,200 uh, atoms in the unit cell. And these are also comprising of these kind of clusters. Like in quasi crystals, you have these kind of clusters which form their structures. So that makes them 
similar to the quasi crystals there are actually 264 interpenetrating atomic clusters of these two different types 128 one and the other one. so this is a complicated structure and very i mean in order in organic systems such kind of structures are quite um, uh, uh, not we don't encounter them uh, on everyday basis but uh, so as they are so large our theory colleagues could not do the theory because this was so large to to handle but all the <laughs> atomic positions <laughs> are hmm. one more minute last one yeah sorry so you have one more minute to finish yeah sure, sure. So, yeah. So this is the importance of studying the high order approximants that we have. Their resistivity, which is similar to the quasi crystal, shows a negative TCR, the high order approximants, whereas the low order approximants behaves like a metal. So this is the management of the high order approximants. And if you look at them, the ALPD, CRFE, ALPD, and well, they look not so different. But the angel lies in the details. And uh, this is the details here. If you look at the states close to the Fermi level, you can see there is a clear difference between these three samples. And if we look at them, analyze them, and find the shape of the pseudo gap, if we close, uh, close down on this uh, graph here, you can see this is the pseudo gap of ALPDMN, and the ALPDCR and ALPDMO have deeper pseudo gap, slightly deeper pseudo gap compared even to the ALPDMN. And this tried to also confirm through real bulk measurements like specific heat, because due deeper pseudo gap implies separation of electronic states, and that is related to the, the specific heat, and the specific heat also confirms this. The reasons can, uh, comes partially from the study of the pore level, where you see that there is a stronger SPD hybridization uh, in the approximants resulting from uh, looking at the shapes of the plasmons. And we also look at the aluminum 2S line shape, their lifetimes, and we see that there might that might be one possible reason. So we observe pseudo gap in high order approximants in and it is deeper compared to the quasi crystal, which has a similar E by ratio. There are possible reasons. I we say there are possible reasons because uh, uh, the theory could not be done. So the details of the theory, the details of the structure is even not known for LPDMN. What is the structure? All the theory is done on a model structure and that too on the approximates. So for the experiment, we say that there's possibly two reasons, stronger SPD hybridization, or it is possible that the efficacy of the hume rothery mechanism is better in case of the approximates because of the you know, translational periodicity. But nevertheless, our work provides a pathway in search for new quasi crystalline phases. Because if we find an approximate which is which has a deep pseudo gap, it is more or less we can expect a quasi crystal around that thing by the value in systems similar with similar composition. Thank you. Thank you, Shurita. Uh, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll take some question, but probably we'll take only one because of lack of time. So, uh, is there a question in the chat? So, okay. So, let's see in the hall. Is there a question? Okay. New view. Okay. So, there are no questions as such. So, let's thank uh, Sudipo uh, for excellent talk. So, yeah, welcome. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Sorry. Kanishka Biswas to deliver the talk. Uh, Kanishka. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah. So. Uh, Thank you again. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about local versus global structure in solid state chemistry and its implication in thermoelectrics. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about the zintel phases. So zintel phases are discovered by German chemist uh, Edward Zintel in 1930s. So zintel phase, somebody is not muted, I guess. Yeah. 
So uh, Zintel phase has polyanionic uh, framework like this, and it has uh, electropositive uh, atom or cationic framework in, uh, inside that. So, uh, and this Zintel phase shows many important uh, properties. So today I'm going to show some of the important properties of this Zintel phase. So it, it, please remember it has a anionic and cationic framework. So, uh, and today I'm going to talk about mostly on the rattlers. So for example, this positive electropositive ion uh, can actually rattle in this channel. And then how we can visualize this uh, rattler, we can visualize this rattler like a bird in a cage, okay. So now uh, I'm going to talk about this compound, thallium indium telluride, where thallium is plus one, indium is plus three, and tellurium is two uh, minus oxidation state. And it has very interesting structure where indium and tellurium uh, forms this uh, tetrahedra, which joined in edge sharing mode and forms this one dimensional chain. And this is a covalent framework, whereas uh, thallium uh, sits in the channel uh, and this has a uh, Thomson cubic geometry and this has ionic weak ionic interaction. So in 2017, we showed the, this compound uh, show, show ultra low thermal conductivity, very, very low thermal conductivity compared to many state of art material uh, uh, in the uh, uh, field of thermoelectrics. And we try to understand why this compound shows very, very low thermal conductivity. So the, uh, one of the reason could be because it has uh, like bonding hierarchy because it has covalent bonding and ionic bonding. So this is very interesting. So two different uh, substructure, which will we, one is having weak weak bonding, another one is having strong bonding. So that is the motivation we started that work, and we try to understand more uh, by uh, pair distribution function analysis by uh, a PDF uh, beamline at uh, uh, Petra. So we have when we have done PDF, actually we have uh, seen. Uh, uh, this kind of data and when we try to analyze that we sh we have seen the first peak comes uh, due to this indium tellurium uh, bond which is a covalent bond shorter bond from this tetrahedra the second peak comes uh, due to this thallium uh, tellurium bond distance which is a weak ionic interaction and the third peak is basically third nearest neighbor and and that this local uh, structure can be visualized if we analyze this three peak properly and the global structure can be analyzed if we uh, analyze this uh, uh, higher R peak and which is fitted uh, both the uh, both the cases fitted uh, fairly well in this case. So let's see. Uh, uh, we have done temperature dependent PDF, X-ray PDF from 100k to 400k, and you can see this covalent bond uh, bonding framework that is the indium tellurium bonding. Uh, the intensity uh, does not decrease much, whereas the second and third peak the intensity decreases heavily. So that tells basically uh, uh, basically this uh, thallium tellurium bonding is weak and thallium can uh, vibrate in that uh, channel. And moreover, this compound has bonding hierarchy, covalent and ionic bonding framework. So uh, I can give a good analogy. For example, if I consider uh, Mr. P, which is uh, who is a phone on, uh, goes every day from home to office, and if we get a smooth road, he will reach very easily to the office. But this is not the case here. Uh, uh, he gets uh, lots of pothole in the roads, and that means this, this road is basically having uh, two different kind of uh, 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 interactions. One is covalent interaction, another one is ionic interaction. So that means when we have a bonding hierarchy, we'll, we'll have uh, phonon scattering and that's why we'll have low thermal conductivity. So let's see the next parameter we have analyzed from this PDA, temperature dependent PDF is the at atomic displacement parameter, which is nothing but the thermal parameter. You can see this thermal parameter of this thallium uh, is much, much higher compared to the other two atoms. And this math uh, actually almost to the double. And th that means this thallium actually rattles in this channel. So this is uh, kind of a classic rattling, intrinsic rattling uh, we have seen in this compound. And from this uh, rattling uh, ADP, we have uh, uh, estimated the Einstein mode. Einstein mode is nothing but the low energy phonon mode, which is about 13, 30 centimeter inverse. So now the question is, can we visualize this Einstein mode uh, by experiment? So in order to do that, the next experiment we have done inelastic neutron scattering in RAL UK. Uh, and you can see uh, there are low energy phonon modes uh, experimentally obtained, which is very important, 28 centimeter inverse, 45 centimeter inverse, and 77 uh, centimeter inverse. And this is matched uh, well with our uh, previous JAX paper where we predicted this phonon uh, dispersion uh, by, uh, by DFT calculation. And this low energy phonon modes are actually coming from this thallium rattler. So, and, and we have estimated uh, this phonon lifetime from the line width, which is ultra low value uh, below the one picosecond. So that phonon dies down in this system heavily and that's why we see ultra low thermal conductivity. So now uh, the first case, as I told you, we have a portals in the road. That means the bonding hierarchy. 
uh, the, uh, the 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 phonon scatters uh, uh, moderately. But once we have a rattling atoms, we can think we have a, another car in the road and who is like this, uh, doing like this, and uh, that's why it, uh, this, this car uh, delays too much. Mr. P delays too much for the office, and when he reaches office, actually he, he his condition is like this. So basically, phonon dies out system like heavily, and that's why we have ultra low thermal conductivity from the combined effect of bonding hierarchy as well as the anharmonic rattling. Okay, so so uh, the bonding hierarchy uh, or bonding heterogeneity we have proved by uh, the experiment that uh, extra PDF experiment at Petra DC and the low energy phonon mode we have experimentally seen in INS uh, measurement at uh, ICS RL RL ICS and this work has been published in Angwandi Kemi just this year and it, uh, it has been a news uh, article in the uh, RL uh, UK website. So with that, I'll go to the last part of my talk. Uh, how much time I have? Okay, sure. So the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about tin telluride. So tin telluride is a well-known compound in solid-state chemistry as well as in thermoelectric, and it has rock salt structure, sodium chloride structure, that means interpenetrating face-centered cubic structure. And it has a thermal lattice thermal conductivity. It starts from 3 watt per meter Kelvin and goes down to 1.2 uh, watt per meter Kelvin. But if someone calculates this minimum thermal conductivity from the sound velocity values as well as uh, volume of the crystal, uh, the value is 0.5 watt per meter Kelvin. So when we started this work in uh, like two, three years back, we thought, like, can we decrease the thermal conductivity of the tin tailway to this much? So in order to do that, uh, we know uh, we can decrease the thermal conductivity if we can create soft phonon modes, which can actually scatter the heat carrying acoustic phonon mode and can give rise to low thermal conductivity. And then we have uh, came, came uh, came across the phonon dispersion of this rock salt uh, uh, tin tail right at, uh, uh, at zero Kelvin. You can see there is a uh, ferroelectric instability coming uh, due to this uh, instability due to this optical uh, phonon modes, which is well known in the literature. And then we came across to the Japanese paper in 1975. We have shown by experiment there is a Romberdal phase table below uh, 80 Kelvin, which is actually uh, non centrosymmetric and uh, uh, shows this ferroelectric uh, instability. Uh, but at a higher temperature, we'll have a cubic rock salt structure, which is non centrosymmetric structure. So now, now our goal was to can we bring this ferroelectric instability near to the room temperature or, or slightly above the room temperature so that uh, uh, we'll have lots of uh, uh, low energy optical phonon modes and that will scatter the acoustic phonon and give rise to ultra low thermal conductivity. So, in order to do that, we have purposefully to the germanium because germanium sits just above the tin, so it will have much more active uh, forest to lone pair than tin. So, so we have doped around 30 percent of germanium. We showed the phase transition temperature shifts near to the room temperature. So that is our first goal. So uh, then uh, we have collaborated with Umesh Wagmare from JNCSR, who showed that uh, the ferroelectric instability increases hugely in this germanium doped tin telluride, uh, and the unstable phonon mode uh, we have observed except R point, uh, all all the points. And if we do the Fourier transform, we found it out that there is a chain type local germanium distortion. So I'll summarize. Uh, uh, in a layman word, like basically we'll have a global uh, rock salt structure of tin tail right? And when we dope germanium, the germanium locally distorted like a chain fashion, but the global structure is cubic. So can we see this local structural distortion, why this ferroelectric uh, instability is coming? So in order to do that, we have done again pair distribution function analysis in Petra. Uh, and we have seen the local and global structure and the local structure cannot be fitted well with the uh, 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 basically cubic model that is the rock salt model but the global structure is fitted well with the cubic uh, model but when you distort the structure uh, along the lombardal direction 111 direction of a cube slightly distorting the germanium we see the the local structure is fitted very well but the global structure is not fitted so that means the local structure is lombardally distorted because of germanium lone pair whereas the global structure is remains like rock salt structure and uh, we have than the temperature dependent PDF, which shows that germanium is distorted 0.1 angstrom uh, uh, locally, which is quite uh, big in terms of a bond length, and uh, uh, the distortion remains above 2, uh, 2 TC. So that means uh, uh, this local distortion actually creates this ferroelectric instability in rock salt tin telluride and give rise to uh, low energy phonon modes, optical phonon modes, which scatters the heat carrying acoustic phonon mode. Which, and that's why we measured very, very low lattice thermal conductivity. That was the record low value uh, in tin telluride uh, uh, thermoelectric. You can see there is a huge decrease when you dope uh, germanium percentage of 30 uh, in this tin telluride. And with that, we got a very, very high ZT, uh, around 1.6 in this material. So this paper actually first time shows that 
these two fields can couple like ferroelectric instability and thermoelectric uh, for uh, good reason and then uh, uh, can give rise to high thermoelectric performance. And this work is published in Energy Environmental Science in 2019. With that, I'll conclude the talk. Uh, intrinsically low thermal conductivity is an attractive paradigm for developing high performance thermoelectric material. Fundamental understanding of chemical bonding and the crystal structure, especially local versus global structure, which can be probed by X-ray PDF very easily. And uh, its correlation uh, with thermal transport is the key to make uh, good thermoelectric material. And of course, uh, uh, like experimentally uh, uh, obtaining this phonon uh, density of states or phonon dispersion can be possible by uh, inelastic neutron scattering experiment, which is uh, can be done in RAL UK. So we have uh, used both the facilities well. And uh, uh, that's why and we have showed for the first time this ferroelectric instability can be readily applied to boost the thermoelectric performance. Uh, and uh, uh, and it can be used in many materials which are closer to ferroelectric instabilities like say PBT, germanium telluride, and many other materials. With that, I thank my excellent collaborators, not only in GNC and in other places, and also generous funding from SERB, DST, Tata Steel, Shekshagar Lab, and New Chemistry Unit, GNCSR, and of course from the synchrotron uh, uh, project, which I have uh, used uh, a few times. And thank you. Uh, I'd be happy to answer all the questions. Thank you, Kanishka. So, any questions? Both you too. Any questions from audience? Chat. What is the question? How to see? Application of low thermal conductivity. So application of the low thermal conductivity is huge. Because you need a low thermal conductivity uh, material to make a good thermoelectric, uh, that is the first criteria. And But of course, you have to have a good uh, electrical transport with low thermal conductivity. So thermoelectric is the application. Another application is thermal barrier coating, which is a very big field uh, for uh, gas turbines and many other uh, applications. And also, uh, uh, there are other uh, uh, thermal register and there are several fields where low thermal conductivity has uh, a extremely uh, high application. Okay. Um, at the interest of the time, so we will wind up this talk here. Yeah. So I hand over to Kanishka for the last sit. Yeah, Kanishka. So uh, thank you again. So uh, 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 now I uh, invite uh, uh, Mr. Rahul Mohavir uh, Verma. Rahul, are you here? Uh, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Could you please share your slide? Yes, sir. Is it visible, sir? Yeah. Can you make uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. full screen? Yeah. And I, I must say that uh, Rahul uh, is from uh, Professor D.D. Sharma's group in IIC. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, can I start, sir? Yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much, sir. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to inform you that Professor Didi Sharma is tied down with a conference this afternoon that he has committed much earlier and could not be able to see. So he has requested me to convey his apologies for his absence and he mentioned that he will try to join the meeting whenever he finds any suitable gap in the conference. Uh, at the end, like I want to thank the organizer also for allowing me to present this work in his place. So this is the list of publication which uses the various experimental facility at the Petra 3 beam lines building. And these are the manuscripts which are under preparation. Uh, and today I will be presenting my work, which is entitled as Electronic Structure Across the Antiferromagnetic Transition of Nickel Oxide. Before that, uh, I would like to show you the activity we are also doing at the RAL facilities. So these two groups are recently has got accepted in one, one is uh, physical review letter and another is on physical re uh, review research. This one manuscript is under preparation and this proposal has got accepted recently for the museum. So in this work, we are trying to understand does the magnetic ordering has any influence on the electronic structure across the antiferromagnetic transition of nickel oxide or not. So, yeah. So before going to the motivation and results, I, I would like to give a brief introduction about uh, uh, nickel oxide. So band theory uh, suggests that uh, for a system to be insulator, 
uh, the highest scale band should be completely filled and for a metal it should uh, it should be the partially filled band so in another word fermi level will lie inside the band gap for insulator in the case of metal it will lie inside the band uh, although this theory was successful in uh, many respects but this theory fails to explain many property of 3d tension metal oxide which is pointed by de bohr and warwe uh indeed this theory suggests that the all cd tension metal oxide should be metallic in nature but in reality most of them are either insulator or shows a metal to insulator transition so to solve this disagreement mod and later on howard introduces the on site coulomb interaction term u and proposes a charge fluctuation of this uh, type where n is the number of electron and alpha beta are two uh, different tension metal side Although the introduction of such a Coulomb interaction term was successfully explained the electronic structure of early thin transition metal oxide, but this theory fails to capture the experimentally observed valence band spectra for late three transition metal oxide. On the other hand, Slater ascribed this insulator insulating behavior to the magnetic ordering such as antiferromagnetic long range ordering because most of the mod insulator have magnetic ordering at least at a low temperature. So uh, this insulating behavior uh, coming due to the band gap is generated uh, due to the doubling of unit cell uh, 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 due to magnetic periodicity. Indeed, some of the calculation produced very small band gap of 0.2 electron hole for nickel oxide. But this later insulator is different than the MOT insulator where the insulating gap arises due to the Coulomb interaction energy U. Uh, but in case of Slater insulator, it arises due to the antiferromagnetic alignment. So one, uh, so the Slater insulation, uh, Slater insulator must uh, uh, transit to the metal if one go above the transit, uh, if one go above the antiferromagnetic transit temperature. But for uh, MOT insulator, it will remain insulator even if you go above the transition temperature. Uh, so this theory was then falsified by Swarovski and Alin, who uh, uh, experiment, uh, uh, who has done the experiment for. Photo electron and Bremsstahl Lang isochromate to measure the valence band and the conduction band, and they have shown the actual band gap of nickel oxide is 4.3. And hence, the Slater band picture does not provide the correct description of the band gap for nickel oxide. For a long time, it was not uh, clear why the uh, band gap of most of the correlated uh, system is not being given by the Coulomb energy term U. Uh, this puzzle has been solved by Zanin, Swatsky, and Allen, who introduced another kind of energy which is which plays an equally important role, namely charge transfer energy. If you have a system where the Coulomb energy is large, then the low excitation energy will happen from oxygen 2p to the transition metal 3d ion, and now the band gap will be given by the charge transfer energy delta. So Zanin, Swatsky, and Allen argued that now this band gap will be determined by either of these two smaller quantity. Uh, if uh, U is less than uh, delta, then the system will be known as Mott insulator. On the other hand, if uh, delta is less than U, then the system will uh, call it a charge transfer insulator. So this finding resulted in a new classification of the transition metal oxide, uh, which is known as zanin swarovski allen phase diagram. Before this, nickel oxide was thought to be a, a prototype Mott insulator, but after the introduction of charge transfer energy, the uh, Zanin, Swarovski, and Allen uh, redefined this nickel oxide as a charge transfer insulator. So, uh, nickel oxide is well suited system where nickel oxide forms a rock salt type crystal structure where uh, intramolecular spins are aligned ferromagnetic ferromagnetically in one 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 plane, and interlayer spins are aligned antiferromagnetically. It has an uh, antiferromagnetic transition temperature of 525 Kelvin. So one can ask a question here, does this magnetic ordering influence the electronic structure or not? So in 1996, both Eisenberg et al. have performed photo emission experiment at three different temperatures, 300, 500, and 615. And after a detailed uh, analysis, they concluded that the magnetic phase transition does not influence the valence band spectrum. Uh, in 2013, Hariki et al. have investigated nickel 2 p X-phase spectra using the DP model and simulated a nickel 3D uh, and oxygen 2P electron system within the dynamical mean field approximation. They have calculated the nickel 2 p X-phase spectra in antiferromagnetic and paramag virtual paramagnetic uh, phases at t equals to zero and claims that antiferromagnetic dust will be in the formation of this double peak 
uh, uh, showing that the core level spectra is changing across the <coughs> transition temperature. In 2013, Kubo et al. have performed XPS measurement on nickel oxide and shows that the valence band spectra changes at the antiferromagnetic transition temperature, where they have collected the valence band spectra at room temperature and 525 Kelvin, which is the exact transition temperature. Uh, uh, to explain this, they have said like that in antiferromagnetic uh, region, uh, the uh, central nickel atom is surrounded by the six antiferromagnetically aligned nickel atom. But uh, but if you go into the paramagnetic region, only the three will be aligned as an antiferromagnet, and other three will uh, will be random uh, will be randomly oriented. And the reduction in this antiferromagnet is ordering. Uh, that is uh, also known as non-local screening, which is coming from the nearest nickel atom, is giving uh, is causing the uh, reduction in the intensity of this main line uh, labeled as A. So far, uh, so far we have two experimental uh, reports. One is showing no change, and another one is showing change in the valence band spectra. And one theoretical result is show the prominent change in core level spectra. But both of these experiments have been done by using the photon energy, which is very surface sensitive and uh, can see the surface electronic structure only, which possibly different than the bulk electronic structure. This point uh, gets even more critical when we are doing the high temperature measurement, because uh, at high temperature, there is a chance that some of the oxygen may uh, leave uh, the surface of the sample. So to realize the origin of these changes, we have done the hard X-ray photo emission spectroscopy, uh, which is the uh, bulk sensitive and the ideal tool to investigate this issue. So we have performed variable temperature half space measurement at spectra uh, P22 in line spectra PJG, and we have performed a uh, full heating cycle starting from the room temperature going up to the highest temperature available at the green line that was the 603 Kelvin, which is far above than the transition temperature. Then we started pulling the sample in a stepwise manner down to the uh, room temperature and collected the uh, core level and the valence band spectra at each of the temperature measured here. Before collecting the uh, spectra, we have stabilized each of these temperature by waiting more than half an hour at each of this point. After that, we have again heated the sample up to the 603 Kelvin uh, temperature to uh, we produce all the uh, uh, all the collected spectra at each of these temperatures. So this is a nickel two peak core level spectra collected at 6,000 electron volt energy. These uh, these two spectra are at the room temperature. One is before starting the heating and one is after the heating. And we can see the both of the spectra are overlapping on top of each other, which reflects the fact that the sample is getting bad at the high temperature. Similarly, we have collected twice at the highest temperature, that is 603, and again we can see a good match of nickel to be core level spectra. This is a nickel to be core level spectra collected at each of the, uh, I mean, each uh, temperature uh, during the whole cycle we have performed. And interestingly, we can see all the uh, core level spectra are matching well and, uh, uh, and reproduce, uh, are reproducible. So we are focusing on this doublet feature, which is coming due to the non-local screening uh, by the, from the uh, nearest uh, uh, by the from the nearest nickel atom. So if we zoom this part and uh, stack all the spectra on top of each other, so we uh, clearly see no change in the four level spectra. So if the definition or the explanation given by the Kau et al was correct, so we should get the change in the, uh, uh, either of the or this peak uh, across the antiferromagnetic transition temperature. But uh, our uh, uh, but we are not getting the change that suggests us that even we are in the paramagnetic state, all the antiferromagnetic atoms are aligned antiferromagnetically, but are free uh, to fluctuate uh, above the trans transition temperature. Keeping the local uh, local uh, correlation intact as it is. Uh, similarly, we have collected the valence band spectra, and we do not see any changes. In the uh, uh, one minute. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. It is finished, sir.
so uh, we do not see any changes in core level spectra as well which is uh, uh, good agreement with our core uh, sorry uh, yes uh, which is in good agreement with the core level spectra in conclusion we have performed the variable temperature hardness measurement on nickel oxide single crystal our experimental data reveals that the core level spectra and the valence band spectra do not show any changes across the antiferromagnetic transient temperature and the possible uh, explanation for this is that there is a shortening magnetic ordering which even persists uh, above the transition temperature i would like to acknowledge the people involved in this uh, in this project uh, from our group mr akman singh and mr shaik mandal who has helped me during the beginning dr banavir pal and dr suman mandal who has done the preliminary work and provided the signal question for the next one I also would like to acknowledge the Daisy Ramanand scientist who has helped us helped us a lot, Dr. Kisko, Dr. Patrick, and Dr. Ulka Dubey. This uh, work has supported our DSP Daisy project financially. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rahul. So uh, let's see uh, uh, if we have any questions in the chat box or in YouTube or not. Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. There is no question in chat in uh, YouTube. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Come, come here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, what is the penetration depth for the earlier experiment where you have used like the previous paper used fourteen hundred electron volt energy? Yeah. And when you yeah. used six thousand electron volts. So what is the penetration so, depth so difference? For fourteen eighty six, it is approximately uh, two nanometer. I mean twenty Armstrong. And uh, for six thousand electron volt, what we have used, it is approximately uh, uh, ten to twelve nanometer, or more than that. Hmm? Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Yeah, yeah. So, any more question? Okay, okay. Uh, let's thank Rahul for this excellent talk, and uh, we'll conclude the session today. And uh, I think it went very well, except few glitches that we cannot avoid uh, in uh, in this kind of online uh, platform. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we'll have one more day, uh, and uh, tomorrow uh, we'll start. At sharp uh, nine a.m. Right? Yeah. So, uh, so I think uh, this is uh, the end of today. And uh, uh, and thank you everyone for participating and actively participating. Fine. Okay. Thank you, sir. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kanish. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This section. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Hi, Arpun. Thank you very much. Okay. Come on.